Hello, welcome to Us Wargamer, I'm your host Rob. Today this is going to be a full and in-depth guide to the Cities of Sigmar release in 2023. The entire book has leaked recently and so we've got every bit of rule that we can go through and we're going to go through all of it in this video. And there's some incredibly exciting stuff, not only are there rules for all of the new miniatures, We've still got rules for some of the existing miniatures like steam tanks uh, and or some of the dark elf stuff, some of the dwarf and stuff. So it's going to be really fun. I think this might be one of the most pivotal battle tomes in Age of Sigmar, specifically maybe not because of the rules, but because of the narrative. I think Age of Sigmar should lead with Cities of Sigmar as the main faction. And this won't be my only video that I do about the Cities of Sigmar. We're going to do a video about the narrative and what the cities look like, which is going to be really fun. And we're also going to do like some tier shows and some other stuff. So if you do enjoy this video, do make sure you check out those other videos in the future. I'm recording this right now with the Twitch chat. This is how I go through these battle tone reviews. We pick apart each an individual part of these units, the rules, and we condense that down into a, into a YouTube video for you. So I hope you enjoy this video, uh, and if you do, you can support the show by joining the Honest Wargamer Patreon, which would be wicked. Right, let's get straight into the rules. Okay, so inside this book, uh, inside this battle tone, we have 11 sub-factions. Those sub-factions are cities, and this is a really cool feature of the Cities of Sigmar. I've already started talking to the chat about how I would like to build my specific city, even where we could do a Horus Heresy-style cities-only tournament where everyone brings their cities for domination and to who is the best city of Sigmar, which is super cool. So 11 sub-factions, and there are 54 war scrolls in this book the 54 war scrolls in this book are subdivided into three different races humans dwarves and elves unfortunately uh the games workshop have decided not to really integrate how those units work together there are some units which definitely do benefit each one of the races but they pretty much work individually the humans pretty much work amongst themselves dwarves amongst themselves and elves amongst themselves and we see that played out in the rules actually quite disappointing if i'm honest i would have liked to have seen them more integrated together like we've seen in previous books uh, and i think that kind of makes sense more in the law but we are where we are we've got 11 sub factions 54 war scrolls to go through we've got two spell laws and a press scripture we've got different command traits artifacts and everything else so let's get into it now, when, normally when you build an army, you'll get battle traits. And the battle traits for Seas of Sigmar are quite different to what we've seen previously because these come in the form of orders. So orders are commands, no, they're not commands specifically, they're completely separate to commands. So command abilities and commands are separate to orders, but they're things that you issue to heroes. Let's read through the rules and kind of talk about it. If you command a Cities of Sigmar army, you can give orders to friendly heroes. Orders are represented by order tokens. Each order token has two sides, one side showing the Cities of Sigmar faction icon, and the other side showing an icon that corresponds to one of the orders. We'll talk about those obviously in a minute. At the start of the battle round, after the priority roll has been made, you can give one order to each friendly Cities of Sigmar hero. So if you have six heroes, you can give out six orders. To do so, pick one of the orders on pages 98 and 99 and place the corresponding order token with the Cities of Sigmar icon face up, beside the hero that has been given the order. No more than three friendly heroes can have the same order at the same time. So while you have six heroes, you can give out six orders, you cannot give out more than three copies of one single order. So that's important to note. There are also ways to manipulate how many orders units can get later on through sub-factions and some unit abilities. Orders marked Cities of Sigma Order can be given to Cities of Sigma Heroes. Those marked Human Order can be given to Humans, Dwarfs for Dwarfs, and Elves for Elves. So there are some generic ones that can be given to everybody, but then the Human ones are only given to Humans, and there are more Human ones, uh, and then there are an equal amount of Dwarf and Elven ones. Orders remain secret until they're revealed. Each order will state when it can be revealed and how, much, uh, and how it is resolved. A friendly unit cannot be affected by the same order more than once in the same phase. But they can be um, affected by multiple orders. Uh, but they just have to be different orders. At the end of the battle round, all orders are removed from play, including those that are not revealed. So they're not like commands... Uh, and it specifically says there in the designer's note, if you have more heroes, then you will get more orders. And this is quite interesting depending on how strong those orders end up being. 
if the orders are so effective, you'll probably try and get more heroes on the board. And most of those orders require you to be near a hero to make them work. Therefore, taking a lot of heroes in this army is going to be quite important. And that makes sense. It's a Cities of Sigmar army. It's an army of like leaders and kind of like conscripts and infantry going out there and doing stuff. So those commanding officers are fairly important. All right, let's go look at what these orders are, shall we? The first set of orders that you can see here are generic ones that we can give to humans, dwarves, or elves. And they're quite strong, but some of them quite clearly are already designed to be working with the humans. So let's talk about advance in formation. You can reveal this order at the start of your movement phase. If you do so until the end of that phase, add three inches to the move characteristic of friendly Cities of Sigmar units that start on normal move within three inches of a hero with this order, which is pretty nice. Put one hero, make sure there's enough units clumped around him, and then make sure that they all move away, which is quite good. And three inches is really fast. It will make some of the units, especially the dwarfs, really, really fast. And that's very good for them. Almost doubles their movement. However, this has got a, like an addendum. It says, in addition, at the end of the phase, friendly Castellite units, which are things like the new cannon or the fusiliers or the ogre with the guy on the top, uh, with the fortified position ability, can establish a fortified position even if they made a normal move in this phase, if they're within three inches of this hero with this order. And this is actually really big because uh, fortified position means that they ignore modifiers when they're being shot at. And it's effectively like a negative for moving your very defensive kind of shooting units, your fusiliers and your cannons. This order just means you can immediately ignore that, which is wicked. So they have all of the bonuses and none of the negatives. So I think that this is going to be the ones that you see taken a lot, especially because... I think the fusiliers are probably pretty good and you're going to see quite a few of those on the table the other and and this ability while really useful for all of the cities of sigmar obviously keys in really nicely with those singular units but like i've said dwarfs are going to be able to make a massive uh, bonus out of this because it's going to get to move so much faster and the next one is counter charge you reveal this order at the end of the enemy charge phase and if you do so you pick one friendly city to sigma unit that's within three that's more than three inches from all enemy units and is within three inches of the hero with this order you can attempt to charge with that unit in addition if that unit makes a charge move in this phase improve the rend characteristic of that unit's melee weapons by one until the end of the turn and this is really really nice because you've got some pretty good combat units in the cities of sigma book it's not keyword locked it's just any cities of sigma unit which is nice so hammerers for example can uh, do some counter charging which is really good and improving the rend is really significant because you can be able to do a ton of different a uh, ton of extra damage so it's quite good it's going to be difficult to orientate as well uh, because you have to always be be within three inches of these heroes and i think that's going to be true for most of the orders so like aoe or area of effect damage could be really good into a cities of sigmar army because you're going to be able to do splash damage to both the heroes and the units around them which is good and maintaining those units within three inches of your hero is going to have to be something you work really hard to achieve. But it's really good. A good counter charge. Charging in. This is sometimes a sub-faction ability for whole other armies. So charging in your opponent's sub-faction just being an order is... Uh, sorry. Charging your opponent's charge phase just being an order is really, really good. It's good. It's a great, great ability. So the orders that you can only issue to humans are called human orders. That reads kind of weird. We've got three. Return fire, suppressing fire, and engage the foe. So the first one is obviously to do with shooting. It's called return fire. You can reveal this order when a friendly unit within three inches of the hero with this order is targeted by a shooting attack. If you do so, after all of that enemy's unit's shooting attacks have been resolved, you pick one friendly Cities of Sigma human unit that is more than three inches from all enemy units and within three inches of the hero with this order, that unit can immediately shoot. Okay, so three inches already is like pretty small. Unless you're using like a large base, I don't know, like uh, a Hurricane uh, or like a Free Guild General Griffin, any of those things uh, would be, they'll have a larger base, therefore a larger area of effect. But if any unit within three inches is shot, it means another unit within three inches of you can shoot. And it doesn't have any negative to the modifiers. This is incredibly devastating, potentially. You can shoot in your shooting phase, shoot in their shooting phase and even if they charge you obviously you can do an unleash hell and then do another shooting phase so this feels like this is definitely tied to things like fusiliers but you might use this on things like cannons uh, could be really effective as well and it might shut down a lot of shooting that your enemy does to your army 
Three inches, though, is very condensed. It's very close, and your opponent, when it's got range attacks, has obviously got the option to not shoot at that. So they know it's going to happen, potentially, but because the orders are secret, they don't know if you've issued an order to do that or if you've issued an order to do an extra move. So it's kind of like a fun counterplay with your opponent there. But this obviously ties in with the idea that you're going to get more shooting out of your army. So I wouldn't expect to see people try to utilize this to make shooting armies. The next one is suppressing fire. You can reveal this order at the start of your shooting phase. And if you do so, you pick one friendly city to sigma human unit within three inches of the hero with this order. After that unit shoots, all of its attacks targeted the same enemy unit, you roll 2d6 and add the number of models slain by those attacks to the result. So if I kill five and I roll five on the dice, I'll get a total of ten. If the result exceeds the bravery characteristic of that enemy unit, it is suppressed until the end of the turn, and the suppressed effect is the strike last effect applies to that unit that is suppressed. So you've got some pretty good long-range shooting in this army, uh, making it so that one of your shooting units means one of your opponent's strikes last. They don't really get to do anything about it. It is really good. But obviously this doesn't work really well on things like monsters, because you're not going to slay any of them. Uh, but... Um, this is still kind of effective uh, if you're bringing some combat as well. And it means your army will work more cohesively together. This is also super important as well because there's a battle tactic which relies on you suppressing a unit. So this one is one you're going to expect to see a lot and therefore expect to see lots of shooting units in armies because it gets you a battle tactic, I think. The last one is human order engage the foe. And you reveal the start... Uh, reveal this order at the start of the charge phase. When this order is revealed, you pick one friendly city to sigma human unit that is more than three inches from all enemy units that has not yet fought in its battle and is within three inches of the hero with this order. If that unit makes a charge move in this phase, add one to the attack characteristic of that unit's melee weapons until the end of the following combat phase. So if you've got like a unit that's got a lot of attacks already, let's say like Cavaliers, the new horse unit for Cities of Sigma, then add plus one attack is good because like just more attacks. But if you can get a unit that's got uh, like a lot of attacks, like you, you sort of board guys and then give them some additional attacks, um, you know, you're going to get a lot more dice to roll. So it really depends which unit you want to do this on. This feels like one we're going to see quite a bit as well, especially I think this will end up on Cavaliers anyway, um, getting those extra attacks, which I think is quite interesting. If you look at all of these or the five that we've seen so far, three of them are very much orientated around shooting and then two around combat so that gives you kind of an idea of how maybe they want you to build the army so far uh, and they're quite interesting but these are kind of your uh, allegiance abilities for humans let's go and look at what the elves and the dwarfs have so we only have two dwarden orders we've got form shield wall and the grim last stand Form shield, wall, form shield wall you can reveal at the start of the enemy combat phase. And if you do so, you can pick one friendly Cities of Sigmar Dwarden unit that has five or more models and is within three inches of the hero with this order. That unit forms into a shield wall until the end of that phase, and while a unit is formed into a shield wall, the strike last effect applies to it, but they gain a five-up ward save. So they're much more defensive with a five-up ward save, but they strike last. This feels like it's going to be really good. Shield breakers have the ability to turn this into a four-up ward save. So in some situations, you might literally build a castle wall out of Dwardin, which I think is quite interesting and does tie into their narrative quite nicely. It's important to note that you can reveal this order at the start of the enemy combat phase, so it won't be working in your combat phase. Um, but I already think there's going to be a mechanic where, you know, kind of making your opponent confused as to which orders you've got because they're hidden is going to be quite important and then revealing them at the right time is quite good. The other one is the Grim Last Stand. You can reveal this order at the start of the combat phase, and if you do so, you can pick one friendly Cities of Sigmar Dwarden unit within three inches of this hero, and until the end of that phase, each time a model from this unit is slain by an attack, made with melee weapons, you can pick one enemy unit within three inches of that model's unit and roll a dice. On a 5+, plus, that enemy unit suffers a mortal wound. So we've got murder rolls from Korn in here. I guess this is to represent a Grim Last Stand. Interestingly, depending on the points, if you can build hordes of dwarfs, which would feel a bit weird because they're meant to be quite elite, then maybe this would be effective. But this doesn't even really work in a corn army, especially when you can have things as cheap as like Blood Reavers and you've got something like Corgus Cull, who's got the ability to make them roll two murder dice or, or two Grim Last Stands versus one. So while this is like, I guess, a nice little addition amount of mortal wound in your Dwarden force, doesn't really add as much as I would overly want to the Dwarden army. But the, the five up ward save is nice. And don't forget with the From Shield Wall, Form Shield Wall, sorry, 
you can have three different characters and each one of those could issue this to three different Dwardin units. So you would end up with three units with a five up ward safe, which could be most of your army. If you know, if you double reinforce two units, you could have an incredibly solid front line, which is quite cool. The th the two, sorry, the two orders you get for elves, 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 a strike them down and swift disengage. Strike them down is you can reveal this order at the start of the charge phase. If you do so, you can pick one friendly Cities of Sigmar elf unit that is within three inches of the hero with this order. If that unit makes a charge move this turn, the strike first effect applies to that unit until the end of the turn. So this is pretty interesting because uh, you get always strikes first, which means you then also get the first activation when it goes into normal ordering. So you get strike first, first, obviously, and then you get, as the person controlling the turn, you get the first go. So you basically get two units striking first, uh, effectively, which is quite good, especially if you're going into like large targets. I don't know, like an Archeon or a zombie, uh, like a Vampire Lord and Zombie Dragon. You end up then being able to get a lot of attacks in before they can strike you back. Although, obviously, if you use uh, the humans, if you use suppressing fire, you'll also get to do that same thing as well, and you won't need to have done the order. Uh, but this is quite a nice little thing, and also it'll combo really nicely with counter charge. So at the start of the, of the charge phase, you'll say, hey, I'm giving this unit always strikes first. And then if they charge within range, you'll be able to counter charge with an always strikes first unit, meaning you'll get to fight before them. So you might even discourage them from charging you, which is quite nice. And I think that's quite fun. Um, so you have to be really conscious of going into these armies and how they're going to get you, uh, especially when counter charge hasn't got any procs other than being within 12 inches of one of your Cities of Sigmar units. It's effectively a, a charge in their charge phase. So you can always strike first and then just do a big gamble charge, which they have to really struggle to get, they're going to struggle to get close to you. So like, it's just super fun. Um, and there are some good elf units like being pointed out in the chat, like executioners, they can do some really solid damage. So that's really fun as well. Then we've got Swift Disengage. This is going to be incredibly hard to pull off, but I think it's, it's, it's a nice little uh, piece of tech. You can reveal this order at the end of the combat phase, and if you do so, you pick one friendly Cities of Sigmar elf unit that is within three inches of the hero with this order, and is within three inches of any enemy units. That unit can immediately retreat. So your unit does have to survive, and it has to survive while also within three inches of uh, your hero, which is important. Um, and that hero has to survive as well. And you have to, all of that has to have happened after you've issued the order. So I don't know how often this is going to become relevant, but I think it's quite good um, because that repositioning could be really key later on in the game, depending on priority roles. But based on how difficult it is, that's quite tough. So the elves definitely have got like some pretty nice uh, things here, especially to do with combat. And the, the Dwarden shield wall, I think, is really fun, especially because you can have so many wounds with a four-up ward save, which is really tough to get rid of. So that's quite that's quite a fun little bit as well. Makes it very, very survivable. Um, We'll see. We'll see. I think it's going to require a lot of skill to use all of the orders that we've just talked about because being within three inches of your heroes is going to require a lot of positioning and really a lot of thinking about. Redeploy might become really helpful, the command ability to make sure you can redeploy your hero within three inches, which I think is quite fun. Uh, there could be some really clever stuff in here. And I also think large bases, so models on larger bases or heroes, more importantly, on larger bases are also going to help you because they've got such a, a larger area for them to be within three inches of different units. But there's some really interesting combo and stuff here, and if you've got any thoughts on them, please do let me know in the comments or, you know, like write them to me in a letter. The first thing we're going to look at in enhancements are the command traits, and these command traits are only usable by your general. You can take one command trait in your army. We have got four command points, uh, command points, command traits for humans. First one is Divine Champion. This general becomes a priest, and if they are not already a priest, in addition, they know the Hammer of Sigmar prayer below, in addition to other prayers that they know. This is quite exciting. Hammer of Sigmar is a prayer that has an answer value of 4 and a range of 12 inches. If answered, until the start of your next hero phase, add 1 to wound rolls for attacks made by melee weapons by the friendly Sigmar human unit while they're wholly within range of the chanter. So this is an AoE mortal wound damage spell. Uh, damage prayer, sorry. Prayer should be important but it only happens on a four so that's important to note um so it's going to be like less reliable than you would think but it is pretty significant uh and 
is one of the best things that we like to talk about in this uh, game. It's an economies of scale ability, uh, which also Master of Ballistics is when we talk about that in a minute, meaning that it affects a lot more units around it. Obviously, also, if you use the order to get plus one attack uh, on a melee unit, and then they're going to have even more dice to roll uh, when they do the mortal wounds. So you've got now a bunch of different things stacking up to make a unit really killer or multiple units uh, killer, which I think is really good. So this one has definitely got like a, a hot pick here, Divine Champion. Next one is Grizzled Veterans. Uh, and this is, free, this is for a free guild unit only. Wound rolls made for attacks that target this general, only wound on an unmodified four. Fans of 40k will uh, notice that this is transhuman. This is kind of okay. Um, like it, it, it's, it's fine. Like wounding on a three and a four isn't that big a deal. If it had been fives, it could have been a legit problem. Uh, but this isn't that good. And it's only on your general. So ultimately, I think it's not going to be as good as uh, Divine Champion or Master of Ballistics. Master of Ballistics feels like probably the hot pick at the moment. Which is if this general issues the all-out attack command to a friendly Castellite unit. So that'll be your cannon uh, or your big reinforced unit of Fusiliers, which is what it will be. Uh, then you add one to the wound rolls for attacks made by missile weapons from that unit uh, in that phase. This effect is in addition to the normal effect of all that attack. So this means you get plus one to hit and plus one to wound on a unit. The bigger you make that unit, the more value you will get out of that. That's what economies of scale is. So uh, you're definitely going to take uh, that, I think. But you might take Divine Champion. Divine Champion is really good. Mortal Wounds are also really good as well. Especially if you're making a far more aggressive army. And then you've got Fiery Temper. And yeah, probably you will end up with like Fusiliers with Master of Ballistics. Like Fusilier Heavy Armies. And then you'll have all the Cavaliers running Divine Champion probably. And then you've got Fiery Temper. You can reroll charge rolls to this general. In addition, this general made a charge move in the same turn. You can reroll charge rolls for friendly cities and cities more human units while they're holding within 18 inches of this general that's okay it's fine um but like it's not as good as the other two so those are the two you're going to take there are three command traits for your dwardian heroes you have a mighty lineage insurmountable resilience a master of the ancient law master of the ancient law is the easiest one the general becomes a priest and if the general is already a priest they know one additional prayer from the rune law prayer making them kind of like a double cast wizard that's fine that's okay that's like you know the prayers of middle they're not that good uh, you've got insurmountable resilience which is at the end of the combat phase roll a dice for each wound currently allocated to this general on a three plus that wound is healed you don't have a massive wound pool on your dwarden heroes and so while this will make them more resilient they're probably just going to get taken off the board in a turn if they're damaged although you know chip damage is a thing in age of sigma so being able to heal them up all the time is quite good um it's it's fine like is what i'm going to say and then of mighty lineage at the start of the combat phase, you can see this general will issue a challenge. And if you do so, pick one enemy hero within three inches of this general. Until the end of that phase, the strike first effect applies to this general. But all of the attacks they make in that phase must target that enemy hero. So do you have a hero, like a Durthu, that can just absolutely wallop our enemy heroes to pieces? Not really. Which is a bit of a shame. So overall, not that impressive for the Dwardin when it comes to command traits. Looking at the three command traits for the Elves, we have Unparalleled Duelist, the Secretive Warlock, and the Draconic Blood Pact. Starting in at number three, maybe? Maybe number... Yeah, we'll start at number three, the Draconic Blood Pact. This is a hero mounted on a Black Dragon only. At the start of the combat phase, you can say that this general will draw power from their Draconic Blood Pact. And if you do so, this general suffers one mortal wound that cannot be negated. However, until the end of that phase, add one to the attack characteristics of the weapons this general's bound is armed with. This is okay, it's just a straight damage buff, but, as we talked about before, to a single model, so maybe not that good. The other one is Secretive Warlock, Wizard only. You can add one to the casting and unbinding rolls made for the general. It's actually quite nice, uh, especially because plus one to cast is really good in this particular GHB. And then finally, the Unparalleled Duelist. For each hit roll of an attack made with a melee weapon that targets this general that does not score a hit, the attacking unit suffers one mortal wound after all of its attacks have been resolved. This is super fun. If you take a super cheap character or a large character, you make them manage to hit, you do a, you know, a roar so they can't do all out attack, and then you just make them suffer tons of mortal wound damage. You could have really offensive enemy combat units just absolutely destroy themselves with your, with your one general, which is legitimately very fun this also combos really nicely with the black arc corsairs also the black arc fleet master so when the enemy is hitting you they're hitting themselves and that's cool 
I love that. And it's also very dark elfy. Ooh, because they took the wood elves out of this. So it's mainly the dark elves that are in this book. So it's all like pain and shadow and, you know, just elven drow stuff. I don't really know. I don't really mess around in those circles, but I'm sure you know out there, you big creep. Now let's look at the artifacts that you can take on humans in your Cities of Sigmar army. The first one is the Brazier of the Holy Flame. Roll a dice for each time a model would flee from a friendly Cities of Sigmar human unit that is wholly within 12 inches of the bearer. On a 4+, plus, that model does not flee. This effectively means that the units are immune to battle shock because even if 30 of them were going to roll away, uh, run away out of a unit of like, I don't know, 10 or whatever. As long as you roll one four plus, one model will still remain. So this is this is even better than immune to battle shock, or maybe it's the same, I'm not sure. But it's really good, and it's uh, but it is a unit wholly within 12 inches. Mastro Vivetti's magnificent macroscope lets you add three inches to the range characteristic of missile weapons used by friendly Cities of Sigmar human units, where they're wholly within 12 inches of the bearer. This feels like it's going to conjoin really well with the Master of Ballistics command trait and all of the other things we've seen so far to make it so you've got a little bit more range on your shooting. But keeping those units around is probably better, so maybe the Brazier of the Holy Flame is really good. I think that might be the best one, in fact. Then you've got Shemex Grimoire, which is for wizards only. And once per battle, the start of the enemy hero phase, you can say the bearer will conjure a storm. And if you do so, roll a d3 until the end of that phase. Subtract the amount from the, uh, of that roll from casting rolls made for enemy wizards. Now, this is good to find, but we are currently in a year-long season where everyone can add loads of primal dice to their casting, so I don't think it makes that effective. We've got the Sigmarite Warhammer, which lets you improve the rend and damage characteristic of one melee weapon the general has by one, which is okay. You can make quite a fighty character. It's not quite as good as making your whole army immune to battle shock. Then you've got the Flask of Lithician Defenders, which once per battle lets you heal D6. That's not very good at all. And then you've got the Glimmer Ring, which once per phase you can reroll one hit roll, wound roll, and attack more roll made by the bearer. Again, that's fine, but it isn't as good as adding plus three inches to the shooting range of some missile weapons or making your army effectively immune to battle shock. So I, I like the Brazier of Holy Flame the best. I think that's the best one. Looking at the relics that you can take for Dwardin heroes, you've got the Book of Grudges, the Padre of the Gauntlets, and the Heavy Metal Ingot. The Heavy Metal Ingot lets you ignore negative modifiers to save rolls for attacks that target the bearer if the bearer has not made a move in the same turn. This is really nice. You want to keep your heroes alive because those are the guys that are going to be issuing orders. And if you are going to take a Dwardin hero and you want it so that they ignoring those modifiers, I feel that's a pretty good one. Um, but they can't move. They just have to be in the middle of like this as stand still and that's pretty bad then you've got the pile driver gauntlets at the start of the combat phase if this unit is within three inches of any enemy units you can say it will strike the ground if you do so the bearer cannot fight this phase however roll a dice for each enemy unit within three inches on a four plus the strike last effect applies this isn't that good uh, all said and done unfortunately um, while you might want lots of units to strike last uh, like uh, in an AoE, you're probably not going to have lots of units around a dwarf character. The dwarf character is really slow. Um, this is this is okay. The best one is the Book of Grudges. At the start of the hero phase, if the bearer is more than three inches from all enemy units, you can say it will read from the Book of Grudges. And if you do so, and also you must bring a book. Like, you have to bring a book. <laughs> Pick one enemy unit that is visible to the bearer and roll a dice. On a four plus, a grudge is found. Add one to hit rolls for attacks made by friendly cities of Sigmar Dwarden units that target the enemy unit until the next grudge is found. So everyone gets plus one to hit against a single unit. It's pretty nice, nice economies of scale. You're shooting units, you're fighting units, everyone gets plus one to hit against that unit, which is great. The three artifacts you can take for your elf armies are the Shadow Shroud Ring, the Venom, blade, the Venom Fang Blade, and the Anklet of Epiphany. The best one is easily the Anklet of Epiphany because it's for a wizard only and it adds six inches to the range of spells cast by the bearer while the bearer is wholly on a terrain feature and or is contesting an objective. This is going to be really nice, especially for endless spells. Setting up those endless spells even further is cool. The Venom Fang Blade is pick one of the bearer's melee weapons. If the unmodified wound roll for an attack made with that weapon is a six, that attack causes D3 mortal wounds to the target in addition to the damage it inflicts. However, the best amount of attacks I think you can get on a Dark Elf is 6, meaning it'll only happen once, so that's not a lot of extra damage. 
And you've got the Shadow Shroud Ring, which is an extra artifact. Once per battle, at the start of your hero phase, you can say that the bearer will use the ring. And if you do so until the start of your next hero phase, the bearer is not visible to enemy units more than 12 inches away. This feels like it's okay, um, especially on the larger models, you know, like a, a Dreadlord on Black Dragon or a Sorceress on Black Dragon. It's quite nice uh, because they don't benefit from the updated Lookout Sir. Uh, but the Lookout Sir was changed in the most recent Battle Scroll update. So most characters are pretty safe, especially for missile weapons beyond 12 inches. Spells are still going to get them and stuff. So I quite like the Anklet of Epiphany a lot. Shadow Shroud Ring maybe on a big character. Pretty cool. Uh, nice. Tell me what your favorite is. Next up, we're going to look at the spell laws. And there's a spell law for the humans. There's a spell law for the elves. And there's a prayer scripture set for the Dwadin. So let's talk about the human spells. First one is Fireball. It's cast on a six and it's a range of 18 inches and you roll a dice for each model in the unit that you target and for every six, they do a mortal wound. This is just not a good spell for clearing hordes because if it's got enough models for the spell law to, for the spell to be effective, then it doesn't do enough damage for the spell to be effective. If it was a five up, uh, that would be really good. The next one, Mystify Miasma, is probably the best spell out of all of them, but it's really good. It's cast on a 5, so it's easy to cast, and it's got a range of 24 inches, which is really long range, which is amazing. If successfully cast, you pick an enemy within range, visible to the caster. That unit cannot run into a next hero phase. It's not that important, but it will help. The important part is, in addition, subtract 2 from charge rolls for that unit until your next hero phase. The reason that's really important is that even if they get within 3 inches, that means they need a 5-inch charge. And if you redeploy, you're going to add on enough that they're probably going to fail a charge so you pick the enemy unit that's really important that wants to fight and you shut down their ability to charge you it's really nice next one is also really excellent and that's pal of doom it's cast on a seven a range of 18 inches and you pick uh, an enemy unit within range invisible to the caster that enemy unit cannot issue or receive commands until the start of the next hero phase it's really really good shutting down uh, the ability to issue commands or receive commands is huge especially in some army builds or against some army builds not necessarily as auto include as uh, mystify miasma but very good next one far's protection is cast on seven has a range of 18 inches you pick a cities of sigma human unit holding the range visible to the caster till the start of your next hero phase you ignore modifiers positive and negative to save rolls for attacks that target that unit now, lots of the units, like our sword and board guys and our fusiliers, have a four-up armor save. But our steam tanks have a two-up armor save. So picking a steam tank to have a two-up unrendable armor save feels like a pretty good choice to me. Next up is Reign of Jade. It's cast on a seven has a range of 12 inches. If successfully cast, you pick a friendly city to see my human model, holding the range visible to the caster, and roll a dice for each uh, wound currently allocated to that model on a five plus that wound is healed so while you've got some big characters uh, especially the guys on the griffins who obviously want to do a lot of healing it's 12 inches so there you have to be really close to them and in addition it's only for every five plus so you're not going to actually heal that much you're probably better off just bringing in life swarm which will guarantee do some heals uh, so i don't think that one's great transmutation is situationally really brilliant Cast on 7 and a range of 12 inches, you pick an enemy unit and you roll a number of dice equal to how many models are in that unit. So if it's a unit of 5, you roll 5 dice. And then you roll based on their armor save. So if they've got an armor save of 3, di uh, three plus, every you roll 5 dice and for every 3 up, then you'll take a mortal wound. So this is really nice against um, units with uh, good armor saves and have lots of models in them. Not very good against like a monster with a good armor save, as an example. Um, but there will be some units this works really well at, uh, works really well into. And you've got the Twin Tail Comet. I'd really like this one to be good. I'd like to try and utilize this, but I think this is going to be too hard to use on the tabletop. Twin Tail Comet is a spell casting value of 7 and a range of 18 inches. If successfully cast, you pick an enemy within range invisible to the caster, draw a straight line between the caster and that one model in that unit. Until the end of that turn, each friendly human unit the line that, uh, that passes across that line becomes Bravery 10, and each enemy unit that crosses across that line um takes d3 mortal wounds and i think i would quite like to make this work i'm mean, i'm trying to think about how it would work on the tabletop just draw a straight line and move through but i'm not sure if that's overly going to happen but it could work really really well like draw kind of a line across the enemy army and then if they try to charge at you through it they'll take d3 mortal wounds so that might be on my list i think i've just got to see what it looks like on the tabletop 
Wild form is cast on a 7 and a range of 12 inches. You pick a city to see my human unit until the start of the next hero phase. You can attempt to charge with that unit if it's within 18 inches and you can roll 3d6 instead of 2d6. So if you do end up building yourself a human unit that's a killer from vanilla thriller <laughs> and vanilla and it tries to do all the damage, then obviously getting that unit to charge in is pretty important. And so you might take wild form. Okay, uh, which is good. Let's go look at the other spells. Okay, we've got sp three spells in the Elven spell law, the lore of dark sorcery. You've got Sap Strength, Umbral Hex, and Tenembral Blades. Sap Strength is a minus one to wound spell. Uh, it's cast on six in a range of 18 inches. You pick an enemy unit, and they are minus one to wound rolls uh, by that unit until the start of the next hero phase, which is good because it carries over for quite a lot of time. Uh, and minus one to wound is probably the best debuff you can get, other than like making it so people can't charge you and stuff. You've got Umbral Hex, which is cast on six in a range of 12 inches. If successfully cast, uh, then you pick an enemy unit within range of the caster until the next hero phase. Each time a battle shock roll is made by that unit, they roll 2d6 instead of 1d6. Obviously, this will work really well with Horror Ghast, where you can't inspire and presence a unit, and then they roll 2d6, uh, run away, like lots of models run away. I quite like that. That's pretty good. But probably the showstopper and what army uh, lists will be built around, especially elven army lists, is Tenebral Blades. It's cast on a 7, and it's got a range of 9 inches. If successfully cast, you pick a friendly Cities of Sigmar elf unit, which is good. Wholly within range of the visible to the caster, until the start of your next hero phase, when making save rolls for attacks made with melee weapons uh, against that unit, then the target has a save characteristic of dash. Now, in the old book, I don't really like to talk about old books, but this spell already existed where you basically would make an enemy unit save dash, but you had to do it from quite a long way. It was really difficult to do. You had to do the Umbral Spell Portal. This one's much easier. You pick a friendly unit, hold it within nine inches. They run off, and any time they do any melee attacks, the unit that they attack has got a save of dash. This is actually quite interesting because there's some combos in here if you wanted to think about it. What you can do with this is cast this on a unit, uh, like, and it says, until the start of the next hero phase, when making save rolls for attacks made by melee weapons, by that Cities of Sigmar elf unit, the target save characteristic is dash. So this means you could just have a ton of different attacks combo into this unit. Uh, and then also, you can combo, the combo I was talking about is, you can make it so that you can cast this spell at a longer range, thanks to the artifact we talked about earlier. And with pluses to cast, like the command trait we talked about earlier, and also the uh, sorceress on Dar on Black Dragon, um, being able to make it so that you get pluses to cast and primal dice, you probably should reliably get this spell off, which means no armor saves for your opponent, which is pretty good. So let's go. Uh, you can do some amazing things with Tenebral Blades, and I think you'll see this a lot. There are three prayers available to the Dwardin from the Rune Law. And it's, you've got the Rune of Unfaltering Aim, you've got the Rune of Oath and Steel, and the Rune of Wrath and Ruin. The Rune of Unfaltering Aim lets you pick a friendly Dwarden unit within 12 inches. It's got a casting value of 3. And lets you add plus 1 to hit rolls to attacks made by missile weapons from that unit until the start of next hero phase. But as we already know, we can get plus 1 to hit from the Book of Grudges, and All Out Attack exists. So this feels a little bit redundant. You've got the Rune of Oath and Steel, which lets you pick a friendly unit within 12 inches, and it's cast on a 3, a Dwarden unit, obviously. And you subtract 1 from wound rolls for attacks that target that unit. This, in conjunction, obviously, with the 4 at ward save, is going to be really positive uh, for making a very tanky unit. And then you can finally got the Rune of Wrath and Ruin, uh, which is hard to say, because you've got Rune and ru Ruin. Rune, Ruin, Ruin, the Rune of Ruin and Wrath. It is a prayer with a, <laughs> of a casting value of 3 and a range of 18 inches. And if answered, you pick one enemy unit within range, invisible to the chanter. You roll 6 dice. For each 5+, plus, you do a mortal wound. If you do 3 mortal wounds, then that unit is ruined. And while this unit is ruined, you ignore positive modifiers uh, to save rolls for attacks to target that unit. And while that's okay, it's, like you, it's quite hard to get 3 mortal wounds off from that. And you don't get a particularly good reward for it. Uh, but it's better than nothing, ultimately. 
so not bad. I, my favorite is the Rune of Oath and Steel. Next thing we're going to look at are the sub factions or the cities in this case, uh, which is super cool. There are 11 of them, which is absolutely mind bending. Uh, none of these sub factions make anything that wasn't normally battle line units become battle line units. And instead, in Cities of Sigma, it's all about which general you have, which maybe unlocks some new battle line units. Don't forget, you need three battle line units in a 2000 point army so 11 cities to go through let's get cracking the first one we're going to talk about is hammer hall action actually actually uh, <laughs> there's a couple of different abilities here we've got officers uh, officer cars of the academy marshal when orders are being given to a friendly hammer hall action hero one of these units can be given two orders instead of one but they must be different orders this is pretty good stacking those orders is going to be really cool especially when we know some of them are so strong like we've seen with the shooting ones as an example and then you've got the magister of hammer hall if you command a hammer hall action army that includes one uh, an allied aventis fire strike which is a stormcast hero at the start of the hero phase you receive one additional command point if that model is on the battlefield now he is kind of the leader of the storm keep that lives inside hammer hall uh, he hasn't got an updated war scroll. His war scroll has no real uh, like synergy with anything else in this army. And his war scroll is not good enough to bring in this army anyway. So for all of the narrative sweet chestnuts out there, then bringing him, in, bringing him in might be really good. But other than that, not really good. And this sub is a bit meh, to be honest. The next one is Tempest Eye, traditionally kind of the shooting one, and the city that always allies in and has good dealings with the Caradron Overlords. They have the rapid redeploy ability. Friendly Tempest Eye and allied Caradron Overlord Sky Vessel units, including units embarked in them, can retreat and still shoot in the same turn. So this is okay. Some of your units are very good at shooting, so you don't want them to be locked up in combat, but you can shoot into combat, so like that's fine uh, i'm not really sure if that's overly good uh but you know maybe maybe it'll work out really nicely let me know if you've got a tempest eye list gray water fastness is the city where or like all the dwardin like originally kind of like settled and built up this industrial city and they have a <laughs> ability called a gray water welcome you can use the all-out attack command up to three times in your shooting phase. In addition, the first two times a friendly Greywater Fastness unit receives the all-out attack command in your shooting army uh, phase, sorry, a command point is not spent. This is just basically brilliant for an army that wants to do lots of shooting, so lots of fusiliers as an example. Um, it feels like they're just making you do this because you're giving all-out attack three times, which is really good. This doesn't combo with the command trait that we talked about earlier, um, where you can give plus one to wound to a unit uh, because uh, you can just issue a command ability three times, but not from the same character. You ne still need three characters to do it. Uh, you just can't, like, you can just do it three times, which is unique, which is brilliant. So uh, a grey water welcome to the Age of Sigmar meta. Lethis is the next one. This is the Realm of the Dead and uh, uh, like the City of the Dead, kind of. And Lethis must be defended. This became a bit of a meme in Competitive Age of Sigmar for a while. And I'm super happy to see it as a, a full-throated city in the Cities of Sigmar. You get two abilities. The Raven Priests, uh, well, sorry, one ability, the Raven Priest, which gives you a prayer. And... Friendly Lethis human heroes that are not wizards become priests. In addition, friendly Lethis human priests and friendly allied Stormcast Eternal priests know the following prayer in addition to any other they know. More does embrace, which if you say it in a kind of Scottish accent, it's like murder, murder's embrace. Murder's embrace is a prayer with an answer of four and a range of 12 inches. So pretty limited range. If answered, pick one enemy unit within range and visible to the chanter. Ward saves cannot be made for that enemy unit at the start of your next hero phase. Now this feels really, really good. It's a little bit unreliable because it's a four up. However, if you were to ally in, let's say, a Lord Relictor from the Stormcast Eternals, he adds plus one to prayers that he chants. So this immediately becomes a three. Then what you do is you turn off a unit's wards and then you just, I don't know, shoot with all your guns. But if you want another fun combo is what you could do is you could take an elf wizard and then you can cast the spell on your elven unit that lets you ignore armor saves effectively or gives them an armor save of dash. So you can make a unit with a prayer and a spell and bring in some like a stormcast unit and some elves have no an armor save of a dash and have no ward saves. And there's so much 
conversion opportunity for that little combo. You obviously can have a Lord Relictor who's a Stormcast, but you could like kit bash your own kind of like deathly style wizard, which is quite fun. Some elves of the Shadow Realm. It's just a great, it's a cool combo. And honestly, you could do some really good stuff with that. If you didn't go along that kind of elven route, just the ability to turn off ward saves on enemy units is amazingly strong, especially if you build like a castle gun line. Your enemy has to charge you to try to beat you up. Turn off their ward saves, shoot them with all your guns. Sounds perfect. Vindicarum is the next one. Uh, this is a city built into the Viscid Flux, the heart of a volcano, which is pretty cool. They get the ability, the Unyielding Faith. Friendly Vindicarum units can receive the Rally Command while they're within three inches of any enemy units. This is huge. Absolutely huge. Rally in combat. In addition, when a friendly Vindicarum Flagellants unit receives the Rally Command, you can return them on a 5 instead of a 6. Now, there is another way to do this too. Oh, and this is only Flagellants. Vindicarum Flagellant units. So when you take hordes of Flagellants, you can rally one of them back, even if it's in combat, but they've got a 6-up save. They probably won't be allowed for very long. Um, I'm not overly certain that this is actually going to see a lot of play, but like... If you're a flagellant guy and you want loads of flagellants for some reason, then this is the one for you, which is super cool. Halohar is the city of magic, and they've got the ability Wild Magic. When you attempt to cast a spell with a friendly Halohar wizard, you can say that they will harness wild magic. If you do so, roll three dice instead of two for that casting roll. However, an unmodified roll of a 10, the caster suffers D3 mortal wounds after any effects of the spell have been resolved. Now, this just isn't as good in a meta where or in a ghp pack where we're all adding primal dice to stuff but it's a good kind of starting point if you really want to cast off a load of big spells um, and if you have a big wizard so a wizard with a large wound pool then suffering those d3 mortal wounds isn't going to be that big a deal i guess to you depending on what you want to do but there aren't loads of uh, there aren't loads of heals in this book anymore like you can't do like a d6 heal uh, which is a bit bad so I think this is okay, but not anywhere near as effective as it would be if we weren't all using primal dice. Next one is Hammer Hall Gyrus. So this is the other side of Hammer Hall because Hammer Hall is actually a city spread across two different realms connected by a large realm gate. Uh, Hammer Hall Gyra, you get the bounty of the Verdant City. The special ability is when picking a Hammer Hall Gyra army, if the battle pack you are using has restrictions on the number of reinforced units you can include, which the battle pack we all play with does, it only lets you include four reinforcements. You can include one additional Cities of Sigmar reinforced unit in your army. In addition, friendly Hammer Hall Gyra human units have a bravery characteristic of 10, while they have 10 or more models. I would say that the that that is a more important ability having everyone have bravery 10 when the bravery kind of is around seven for most of the human units uh, and this also only affects humans as well so if you were going to go humans and if you're going to have lots of bodies on the board like if you're going to have lots of fusiliers for example um you could have more reinforced units which is good uh, and also they're going to be bravery 10 which feels like that's even stronger in my personal opinion so that's quite good especially the bravery 10 element in the realm of life is the living city and these guys have always allied in uh, a bunch of different sylvaneth and tree folk they have a, a, a ability called the hunters of the hidden paths during deployment instead of setting up living city unit or an allied sylvaneth unit on the battlefield you can place it to one side and say that it's set up in the hidden paths as a reserve unit you can set up one unit in the hidden paths for each living city unit you have set up on the battlefield. At the end of your movement phase, you can set up one or more of these reserve units on the battlefield, wholly within six inches of the edge of the battlefield and more than nine inches away from enemy units. So you can keep units off the board. Keeping units off the board is always pretty good, especially in a, an, a game where maybe people are going to do strong alpha strike attacks. However, the orders that you can dish out rely on units being on the board. And so keeping units off the board means you might not get a load of uses for those orders early in the game. So I'm not really so sure this really adds much. Being able to deep strike stuff is kind of okay. Uh, but the army is strong enough to kind of move into the mid board anyway. So I would say this is like a, a fun narrative pick. A, a sweet chestnut choice. Excelsis has this ability called Fearsome Breeds. Or that's the ability you get for these. You add one to the wounds characteristic of friendly Excelsis monsters, and you're like, oh, it's the monster faction. It's actually not. It's the cavalry faction, which is kind of weird. In addition, each time a friendly Excelsis free guild cavaliers unit 
fights. After all of its attacks have been resolved, you pick an enemy unit within three inches of a free guild cavaliers unit and roll a dice for each model in that free guild cavaliers unit. For each roll of a four plus, that enemy unit suffers a mortal wound. So every unit of five, you roll five dice, and for every four plus, you'll do a mortal wound. Now, if you were to buff this up to a unit of 15, you roll 15 dice, and um, and each four up will do a mortal wound, which is a considerable amount of mortal wounds. The cavalier mounted hero uh, will has always strikes first and has an ability to make this unit fight at the same time. So you can have him fight, this unit fight at the same time, and then do all those mortal wounds then. So you're going to do a ton of damage on the charge, which is really exciting. And then you can have another unit of, like, you can just do a lot of damage with this, is what we're trying to say, uh, with very fast... Uh, units this is this is our yeah this fourth yearlings this is absolutely our uh ride for ruin and the red excelsis the next one is settlers gain these guys are kind of allied with the lumineth realm lords they get the ability expert instruction add one to the casting rolls for friendly settlers gain wizards which is pretty good uh, again in a primal meta where you can add loads of dice but as we know especially if we're going kind of like down that elven route we can get a lot of pluses to cast at this stage uh, i think we can get up to plus five um, which is pretty good, and plus six inches to our spell range, so that would be pretty good. In addition, at the start of each hero phase, you receive one additional command point if the model picked to be your general is within three inches of any friendly allied Lumineth Realm Lords heroes. This is okay. Uh, command points, like whatever. Like it's just, like I, yeah, I would say that that's not really that important. But the plus one to casting is good, uh, and that's that's a bonus. Our last one, but not least, is Mist Harven. Known as the City of Scoundrels, which is pretty cool. Uh, they have the ability, the Shadowed Approach. At the end of the hero phase, you can pick up to three different friendly Mist Harven units that are more than 12 inches from all enemy units. Each of those units can make a move of up to D6 inches. And then if the unit has any mounts, it can make a move of 2D6 inches instead of D6. Those units can't end up within three inches of the enemy. This is awesomely fun and very cool, but it, it's, it's really effective, uh, especially if you've got like three shooting units, because with the move order that we saw earlier, you can have D6 plus three inches on a unit moving up the board, which is crazy effective. I also like the idea of using this on heroes as well in the hero phase to make sure they can get close enough to your units so that they can issue the commands as well, because keeping inside that three inches is going to be quite difficult. Sorry, to issue orders, because keeping within those three inches is going to be difficult as well. Either way, a hero phase movement is really strong, and I think that this is actually really good, and I would probably try this. I think this is actually very, very good. The first war scroll we're going to look at is Talia Vedra, the lion -ar, lioness of the parch. So she is keyword locked to uh, Hammerhall Ashqui. Uh, you can see that down there in her keywords, which means she wouldn't get uh, the battle traits or the effects, sorry, from other sub factions if you include her in other sub factions. But you could include her in, let's say, something like Mist Harven, but she won't benefit from the Mist Harven abilities because she has keywords for something else. Okay, super worth talking about. She got 15 wounds with a four up save, which the four up save is a little bit disappointing because that's going to make her quite susceptible uh, to uh, getting killed pretty quickly. And she has a ward save of six plus, so her survivability is pretty much on the low end. She's 340 points. So she's not incredibly squishy, but she's quite squishy, in my personal opinion. She's got a pretty good damage profile. She's got six attacks at damage two, three attacks at damage three, and two attacks that are damage D3 plus three. I think we capped out at something like 32, 35 damage, which is fine, um, and it's pretty good. And most of it's fairly reliable. The D3 plus three damage hits on fours, so that's a little bit of a downer. Uh, and the rend is quite nice as well. Uh, maybe she's a good opportunity to counter charge because she has the fly keyword. So protect her in the front with some screens and then counter charge with this character. Then you would add plus one rend onto those attacks as well. So then she starts doing a legit amount of damage, which is quite fun and also kind of solves the problem of her maybe dying, which I think is an issue as well. Okay, so she's a war master, but she's only a war master in uh, an Ashquian army uh, or a Hammerhall Ashquian army. So that would give her an 18 inch aura of, uh, of command, which is good, which you can also have a general with an 18 inch aura of being able to do commands. Uh, she's got leave from the front, which is an ability where if she's in combat, if she's in combat, then um, a friendly unit, uh, when she issues the rally command to a friendly human unit, then they can rally on a four plus and they can do it while they're in combat, which is pretty interesting. But she does have to be in combat 
which means you've got to like get it in the right like phasing she has to be in combat and then the next hero phase has to happen but that's quite unique as well you don't normally tend to see that um, and that might come up really, really... That's not something you, you make happen. That's a situational point where that becomes a real big bonus, I think. Uh, she's got Unparalleled Tactician, where she gets uh, two orders instead of just one. And if you were to play her in her home faction, in Hammerhall Ashqui, then one of those heroes will get two orders, and then she'll get uh, two orders as well. So that's four orders between two characters. Pretty cool. And then she's got the Paralyzing Venom, monstrous rampage uh which is pick one enemy monster that made a charge move this turn and is within three inches of this unit roll a dice on the three plus the strike last effect applies to that enemy monster until the end of the turn uh so that's pretty good because if you do get charged by a monster then you can make them strike last and then you get to fight first which is quite nice uh, overall for 340 points i'm not sure i'm 100 percent convinced especially as a lot of this book feels like it's all to do with economies of scale you have lots of infantry doing lots of stuff, or lots of cavalry doing lots of stuff. Um, and so I'm not sure she brings loads to the table other than a big old rally. And then she has to be in combat for the big old rally, uh, which is which is quite interesting as well. But maybe as a counter charge piece and a buff piece could be quite interesting. Love to know what you think. The next unit we're going to talk about is the Pontifex Zinestra. It's 150 points, and if you're running a human army, or maybe even any army in Cities of Sigmar, this is the, the most auto-include unit in the book. It's got nine wounds and a five-up save, and moves five inches, so it's a little bit slow, but it's super worth talking about the fact that because it's got nine wounds, it's going to benefit from Lookout Sir, uh, which is pretty good. Uh, now, it's got a couple of abilities. It's got the Voice of the God King. This unit can attempt to dispel one in the spell at the start of your hero phase and attempt to unbind one spell in the enemy hero phase and you get to add plus one to that unbinding roll. It's pretty good. It's got a four-up ward save, which is really nice. So now it's got Lookout Surf for protection. It's also got the four-up ward save, which is also really good as well. And then it's got the ability... And, and for combat, it does, like, no damage. Zero damage. And, it, and for... But its main ability is the Vessel of Sigmar. Vessel of Sigmar is a prayer with an answer of three. If answered, this unit is within your territory, you can pick one of the following effects and you can apply that. If you're outside of your territory, you get to pick two effects, which is amazing. So the first one is Hallowed Ground. Friendly Cities of Sigmar human units have a ward of five plus while they're wholly within 18 inches of this unit. And obviously, this is amazing. Five up ward save for your whole... Oh, sorry. Cities of Sigma human units only. None of the elves, none of the dwarfs. Uh, apparently, they do not believe in uh, the Sigma god as much. So five up ward save, AoE for the whole army, like we saw with Teclas. Incredibly effective, really useful, absolutely stunning. It's going to be in every list, and it's going to make your army so much more survivable. Then you've got the Great Will Turns. Add two inches to the move characteristic of friendly Cities of Sigmar units on the battlefield. And if you combo this with the move order, you're going to get to move like five inches. If you go Mist Harven, you're going to get to go really, really far, which is really good. Uh, cast Out Evil is bonkers. Roll a dice for each enemy wizard or priest on the battlefield. On a two plus, the unit suffers D3 mortal wounds. So you're going to choose one of those, probably the five up ward save always, until you get outside of your territory. And then... You're probably going to also do the mortal wound spam at your opponent's wizards and uh, priests as well which is very very effective and because it's not a spell you don't get spell ignore and because it's um not a prayer you don't get to stop in any way so like it's just very very good and then finally wrath of azir another ability at the start of the combat phase after this unit fights roll a dice for each enemy unit within three inches of this unit on a two plus units uh, uh unit being rolled for suffers d3 mortal wounds so it's got kind of like an aoe mortal wound damage as well ultimately it might be a little bit squishy nine wounds with a five up save but with a four up ward save it's going to stay around quite a while I, I you would hope which is quite good uh, and then it, what it does in the army, though, or what the Pontifex does in the army, is crazy. Absolutely crazy. Five up ward save, everyone in AoE, bonkers. Get yourself one. Probably kit, you bash, kit bash yourself one because it's fugly. But, like, amazing, amazing. The next unit is Flagellance. Uh, berserk, insane, religious fanatics in nothing but a loincloth and some dreams. Uh, they are 100 points for a unit of 10. 
They have one wound each, and they have a six-up save, and they move six inches, and they're bravery eight. They've got a pretty uh, standard profile, uh, two attacks each, uh, two-inch range, fours and fours, with no rend and a damage one. Uh, if they, they have a champion who's a prophet, and he adds one to the attack characteristic, meaning that you get 20, out of unit of 10, you get 21 attacks. But that's not what makes them good. What makes them good is the glorious martyr's ability. Each time one of this unit is slain by an attack made with a melee weapon, you can pick it one enemy unit within three inches of this unit and roll a dice. On a five plus, that unit suffers a mortal wound. Why is that good? Like, your units are dying and you're taking a, a mortal wound. And earlier on, Rob, you said that you didn't want the dwarfs to die because uh, with the and then do mortal wounds on a five plus. So why is this different now? Well, there's a couple of different things that happen between the Flagellants and happen between the Dwarfs. As an example, with the Flagellants, because they're near the Pontifex, and the Pontifex does make the Flagellants battle line, they can go up to a big unit of 30, and they can have a 5-up ward save from the Pontifex's ability, meaning that you're not necessarily going to kill all of them. And if we take them in the sub-faction, where they can get a 5-up rally, then you can rally loads of them back, so you can keep attacking, exploding, rallying them back, because you can also rally in combat. Normally, you can't rally in combat, but the flagellants can. So this means that you're going to kind of like be a, a walking mass of exploding bodies, very much like you would expect religious fanatics to be. That's how it works, which is kind of cool. Like, it's interesting you have to paint up a lot of flagellants. The models are incredibly old and rubbish. Uh, no offense. Um, and we already see this mechanic work incredibly well in Soul Black Grave Lords and the zombie spam list, which we're seeing all the time. Now, this did get FAQ'd in the zombie list because at the moment, you can just remove models that aren't within three and then do the mortal wounds as it's currently written. But this was how zombies were previously written as well. But then it got FAQ'd to within three inches of the slain model. So hopefully, hopefully that'll also get FAQ'd in line with that. So be conscious of that. But otherwise, live out your best religious fanatic dreams running around with a ton of flagellants. Our next unit is an older sculpt. It's the Free Guild, uh, Free Guild Marshal, sorry, on Griffin. Uh, there we go. 50 wounds with a 4-up save, but no ward save on this character. Uh, if you take the Lance, he's got 4 attacks, which on the charge gets an additional plus 1 rend and another plus 1 damage, so the, a damage 3. Uh, there is that command trait, don't forget, where you can add an additional damage, so you could be up to damage 4. Uh, 6 attacks with his Razor Claws that damage 2 and 2 attacks with his Deadly Beak, which are damage, uh, which are damage four, which is pretty nice. Uh, Razor Claw, sorry, are six attacks that are damage two. Um, he can fly, and he's mounted, and then he's got a Piercing Blood Roar ability, and when you carry out the Raw Monstrous Rampage, which means enemy units can't benefit from command abilities, uh, you pick what two enemy units within three instead of one, which is pretty nice. A lot of people include a monster in their army specifically for Raw, so being able to do it twice is pretty nice. And then he's got Tactical Acumen. If this unit is included in a Cities of Sigmar army, once per battle, when the orders are given uh, when the orders are given out to heroes, this unit can give two orders instead of one. Each order must be different. Now, the orders part kind of brings up maybe my problem with this model. It's 270 points, and it's an okay fighting model. But when you are taking heroes, you probably want to maximize orders as much as possible. And while this unit obviously can get those bonus ones, I don't think that this is, like great he does okay damage the buffs oh sorry the command traits and artifacts you give them are okay but i think in this particular instance this isn't the same as a frost or stonehorn so he doesn't really fulfill the role of a support piece or as like a damage dealer well like kind of bridges the gap and does neither job well and so just doesn't really doesn't really make it in for me as a list uh, as a unit sorry uh, any of the free guild marshals by the way as heroes when they are the general they're going to make the cavaliers or the cavalry be battle line so it's worth pointing that out otherwise yeah not not that impressed with his rules but still a great model big fan the next unit is probably another auto include it's the free guild marshal and importantly maybe most importantly the relic envoy now he's got five wounds with three up armor save which is great we love that. That means he's a little bit survivable. Five wounds is a bit risky. A bit risky. He's got a load of different weapon uh, load of different weapon loadouts, I apologize. Uh, with dueling pistols and Master Forge longswords and everything else. So choose your favorite, really. It doesn't really matter. That's not what he's there for. He's not like a combat piece. He's got two special abilities. He's got the Attendant Relic Envoy and the Rousing Speech. The first one we'll talk about is the Attendant Relic Envoy. At the start of your hero phase, you must choose for this unit's Relic Envoy to attend the Marshal or deliver a message to a nearby unit. The Relic Envoy, by the way, doesn't count as a model. 
uh, for the purposes in game. So you just paint him up if you want to. But legitimately moving him around the board, it would be one of the most fun things, especially naming him. Uh, if you choose the Relic Envoy to attend the Marshal, you can carry out a heroic action with this unit in addition to any other unit you carry out a heroic action with. That's a particularly nice thing, especially with the heroic action heal, which is probably something you really want to do, uh, because uh, like at five wounds he'll be survivable, but not super survivable. If you choose the Relic Envoy to deliver a message to a nearby unit, pick one other friendly city's of Sigma human unit, hold it within 12 inches, and until you start your next hero phase, the next time the unit receives a command, the command point is not spent. So a free CP, effectively, which is really nice, um, just just really really good. Uh, or you you know generate another CP on uh, the character with a heroic action. Like you got you got choices, which is really nice. What makes this guy crazy, especially as he's 90 points, is the rousing speech ability. Once per battle, you can carry out the deliver rousing speech, heroic action below, with this unit instead of any other heroic action you can carry out with it. Okay, why is this so amazingly important? Well, okay, the rousing speech ability is this. Pick three friendly different Cities of Sigmar human units holding within 18. For each unit picked, roll 2d6. If the score is less than or equal to that unit's bravery characteristic until the end of the turn, models in that unit count as two models for the purposes of contesting objectives. So now we know we've got loads of inventory. Maybe we're going to do loads of flagellants, as an example, and we're going to take the, the banner so that, uh, sorry, the, the artifact so that like on four pluses, fleeing flagellants won't run away, which is which is super cool. Now they're all gonna count as two on objectives. Or maybe we're gonna make really defensive frontline infantry or shooting units who are gonna also um, count for two on objectives. It's just really strong, it's just really good. Hordes of flagellants, like just really, really strong uh, as an ability. So yeah, for 90 points, he's, I guess he's pretty much an auto-include, to be honest, and just brilliant. An amazing miniature as well. For the incredibly cheap price of 90 points, the new Alchemite Warforger is going to make your armies deadly and defensive all in one go. You might end up getting more than one of these. He's got five wounds with a five up armor save, and to be fair, no ward save, so not that defensive. Can cast a spell, but if he does choose a spell, he has to choose Transmutation of Lead from the spell law, because he's a metal wizard. Um, he's got two, three attacks in combat that does d3 damage, but that's not really why it's there. He's got two cool abilities, or well, a, a spell and a cool ability. His ability is the Runic Crucible. At the start of the hero phase, you can say that this unit will either stoke or expend the power of the Runic Crucible. If this unit stokes the power of the Crucible, you add one to casting rolls to this unit until the end of the phase. If it expends the power of the Crucible, it cannot cast any spells, but until the start of the next hero phase, add one to save rolls for friendly Cities of Sigmar human units while they're wholly within 12 inches of this unit. So AoE plus one to save, a bit like Catagross, and it is wholly within 12 inches, which is quite tough to, to sort out, and it's a fairly squishy character, but he's only 90 points. But plus one save is amazing. It's going to benefit from Lookout Sir, so it's going to be uh, untargetable outside of 12 inches against shooting, which is good. And you're like, wow, that's amazing. Plus one save doesn't need to do any more. Why would I take a second one, Rob? Well, he has a spell called Blazing Weapons. Blazing Weapons is cast on a 7 and a range of 12 inches. If successfully cast until the start of your next hero phase, friendly cities of Sigma human units that have Blazing Weapons while they're wholly within 12 inches of this unit. While a unit has Blazing Weapons, each unmodified hit roll of a 6 for an attack by that unit causes a mortal wound to the target in addition to any damage. So, initially you think oh wow okay like that's going to be really good on lots of combat and doing lots of stuff it's going to be incredible on a castle style army because it's an aoe wholly within 12. so if i had two units of let's say 30 fusiliers each one of those units now is going to be doing a lot of shots and also importantly any hits uh, any sixes to hit are going to be doing mortal wounds Stick these guys in Mist Haven so they're you know moving up D6. Give an order to make them move up an additional um, uh, three inches as well, and uh, and these guys are going to be doing a ton of shots, doing mortal wounds on sixes to hit, which is just crazy. Um, but plus one to save to everyone, great. Mortal wounds on sixes to hit, great. Absolutely must buy. Uh, 
uh, five up ward save on everyone from the Pontifex, Alchemite Warfare Forger, put it in your basket. Coming in at 100 points is easily one of the coolest sculpts out there, the Battle Mage. Look at all those different sculpts that you can build uh, out of the old Battle Mage kit, truly fantastic. Five wounds with a six up save, so not very survivable. He's a wizard, can cast one spell, but isn't locked to any specific spells. Now he's got some really cool, this really cool ability called the Arcane Trinkets, which really ties in with the fact that you can, he's a real uh, kit bashes paradise as a model. When you pick this unit to be part of your army, you can pick one of the following Arcane Trinkets it possesses for free. Record this information on your army roster. He can either have the Ancient Grimoire, add one to casting rolls for this unit, the Eldritch Hourglass for a 5 up ward save. The Enchanted Blade to add 2 attacks to his Wizard Staff, which would take him up to 3 attacks. 3 and 3 is run 1 damage to D3. He's got the Ensorcelled Skull, which is add 1 to Unbinding Rolls for this unit. The Realmstone Orb, which adds 6 inches to the range of spells cast by this unit, which is actually probably the best one, based on the other spells that we saw cast earlier. That will take up uh, like Miasma up to 30 inches, which is amazing. The Ritual Dagger, which is once per battle at the start of your hero phase, you can say that this unit will draw blood. And if you do so, this unit suffers a mortal wound, it cannot be negated, and this unit can attempt to cast one additional spell, which is cool. And then finally, the Spectral Potion, once per battle in your hero phase, you can say this unit would unlock its Spectral Potion. And if you do so, pick an enemy within 12 inches, on a 2+, plus, it suffers D3 mortal wounds. So, for 100 points, he's fine. He obviously doesn't do anything like uh, the previous character did with all of the buffs army wide uh, but being able to cast a spell an additional six inches feels legit and might see play in games the battle mage on griffin is 250 points he's got 15 wounds with a four up save and he moves 14 inches uh so he's he's got the same survivability as i talked about with some of the other characters in this range so not that survivable his damage output is also pretty mid uh he gets uh, it's, it's it's not great to be honest six attacks at damage uh, two and then four attacks at damage three can fly though so he's a bit fast and is a one cast wizard for 240 50 points as a hero so he'll get an order can cast a spell might be quite good to do a mystic shield or something he's got the two-headed ability which uh, any sixes to hit with his twin beaks <laughs> uh, will score two hits instead of one uh, which would be like he's only got four attacks with that so you're not going to have that very often it's fine it's fine ability then he's got gurish ferocity add one to the damage characteristics this unit's razor claws and twin beaks if attacks monsters so you would end up with six attacks at damage three and four attacks at damage four against a monster which is quite nice and then he's got a spell the amber spear unique spell casting value of seven if you successfully cast, you pick one point on the battlefield within 18 inches of the caster that is visible to them and draw a straight line between that point and the closest point on the caster's base. Roll a dice for each unit that has any models passed across by that line. On a 2+, plus, that unit suffers D3 mortal wounds or 3 mortal wounds if it's a monster. So it's not bad to do kind of like an AoE line spell. I don't hate that. It's fine. It's pretty cool. Uh, but like ultimately, I don't think he really adds much to an army. In an army designed to have lots of stuff added to it, so he's cool, he's a nice centerpiece model, but probably not high up on my list of units I'd try and get. Next up, we're going to talk about the Battle Mage on Celestial Hurricaneum, and the Hurricaneum without a Battle Mage on. So the, Celestial, uh, the Battle Mage on Celestial Hurricaneum is 260 points, and its cheaper version um, is 240 points, 220, 230 points for the basic Hurricaneum, so this basic Hurricaneum here. Both of them have 12 wounds with a 4 up save, and they move 8 inches. Now, obviously, the one with the Battle Mage on is a wizard and a hero, which is important, and can cast a spell and unbind a spell. It's also a war machine uh, for, the, for those keywords. It's got the Storm of Shemtech ability, which is quite important. It's definitely not a fighting unit. That's not what it's there for. It's not a fighting unit. Now, the Storm of Shemtech is, in the hero phase, you can pick one enemy unit within 18 inches, doesn't require visibility, and it's an ability, so you can, uh, you know, it's not a missile attack, so you can ignore lookout, sir of this unit and roll a number of dice equal to the number of the current battle round. For each roll of a 2+, plus, the enemy unit suffers D3 mortal wounds. This is on the Battle Mage on Celestial Hurricaneum and it's on the Celestial Hurricaneum itself, so which is at the one without the Battle Mage that's not a hero. Now this is pretty crazy. Number one, because I think this probably requires an FAQ, because it says in the hero phase, which means right now you could do it in your hero phase and then in their hero phase, which means if you have one Hurricaneum, you're going to roll two dice in battle round one and then four dice in battle round two and then uh, six dice in battle round three, uh, which is pretty amazing, doing 63 mortal wounds. Where this becomes pretty nuts 
is when this happens, if you take four of them. So if you were to get four Hurricaneums at 230 points each, that means in battle round one, you would be doing 8d3 mortal wounds. Obviously, you've got to roll the two pluses, but potentially 8d3 mortal wounds. And in battle round two, you'd be doing 16d3 mortal wounds, which is a lot of mortal wounds. Up to, to battle round three, when you're going to be 24d3 mortal wounds. So while obviously I'm not taking into account the fact that you need to roll the two pluses, and you also need to be within 18 inches in the hero phase, that feels like that's a, a powerful amount of damage, which probably should be FAQ to just in your hero phase. But it might not get changed. They've made crazy FAQ decisions before. But right now, that's definitely how it works. And these things are going to blammo stuff. Heroes, monsters, gods, whatever they like. That is a proper storm. A couple of all of the abilities on the Battle Mage on Celestial Hurricane. It's got the portents of battle. Add one to hit rolls for attacks made by friendly Cities of Sigmar human units holding within 9 inches of any friendly units with this ability. This is super good, especially as it's fairly fast at 8 inches, so you can keep up with units. Great for shooting castles. Everyone gets plus 1 to hit. You don't need to spend a command point, which is good as well. So it's a pretty good ability. And then Chain Lightning is a spell which is amazing. Chain Lightning is cast on a 6 in a range of 18 inches. It's successfully cast, pick one enemy unit within range and visible to the caster. That unit suffers D3 mortal wounds, then roll a dice for each other enemy unit within 6 inches of this unit on a 4+, plus. it's D3 more mortal wounds. So this unit itself, with its one spell and its shooting ability, is going to do loads of mortal wounds. And it's also a support piece to a gun platform uh, or a kind of gun castle army with a plus one to hit or even could run up with some other infantry units um, and uh, save them as well. And it's got 12 wounds and 4 up save, which I normally would describe as fairly fragile. But now we know we can have plus one save and give it a 5 up ward save, meaning that it's going to be very survivable. In fact, as survivable as a Stonehorn, which is pretty good for 260 points. The Hurricaneum just isn't a wizard. It's 230 points, it's cheaper, it still has the Storm for doing all the mortal wounds, and it still has the plus one to hit aura, which is really good. I probably am going to see quite a few of these in armies. Uh, maybe four would be crazy, but I'd love to see it. The other kind of battle cart in this army, the War Wagon, is the Battle Mage on the Luminarch of Heesh and the Luminarch of Heesh itself. The Battle Mage version is 250, and the non-battle mage version is 220 points. So, what do we get? So, the, you got a wizard, obviously, and there's Far's protection on that wizard. You don't get to choose. And he's got Searing Beam of Light. So, there's a big cannon on top of it. And this ability lets you just pick a point somewhere along a line. And then every unit that it passes across, or any unit that it passes across on a 2+, plus suffers D3 mortal wounds. This sounds good in theory. Uh, however, and it's a 30 inch range, normally units aren't really spread out in that way that you would think um, And so you don't generally tend to get as much mortal wounds as you would hope from this This is the same as it was in previous editions. You generally didn't see a lot of uh, Luminarchs taking center stage of uh, lists. It's, it has got an aura of protection ability Which friendly cities of Sigmar human units within nine inches have a ward save of six plus but that's not as good as a five up ward save so not, I mean, it's more reliable because it just happens, but it's not as good and you won't take it. And then he's finally got an ability called Burning Gaze, which casts on a six in a range of 18 inches. And an enemy unit suffers D3 mortal wounds, unless it's got 10 models, in which case you double the amount, unless it's got 20 models, in which case you triple the amount. The problem, as I talked about earlier with horde clearing spells, is even if it's got 20 models, doing my mortal wounds isn't going to do a ton of stuff to it, really. Like, um, it's not really worth it, and you can't really guarantee it's going to be very effective. Uh, so, battle not, uh, the Battle Mage on Luminarch of Heesh probably won't see much play. I don't think it, I don't really rate it, it doesn't really add much to the army. And then the Luminarch itself, even though it's very cheap, has the same problem. So, even though they're awesome miniatures, great cool things, I don't think you'll see them play loads, or I personally wouldn't take them because they're not that fun. Coming in at the criminally undercosted and absolutely fantastic 170 points is the Free Guild Command Corps. Now this is quite cool. This is a unit made up of loads of different models, including the frankly incredible Whisper Blade miniature. It's a new one. Um, uh, and a bunch of, like, there's a doggo. He looks great as well. Uh, in fact, in here you get an Arch Knight, the Whisper Blade, a Great Herald, a War Surgeon, a Soul Shepherd, and a Mascar Gar Gar Gargoylean. <laughs> uh, they've got a pretty good attack profile as well there's a bunch of different attacks there's a d6 damage attack there's a d3 damage attack there are three other attacks from the gargoyle with d3 so pretty good each one of the characters uh, brings something special to the table so when you do remove casualties from these choosing the right one to remove is going to be quite interesting also in addition 
uh, this unit has got a four up armor save and it's got three wounds apiece, uh, which means 18 wounds across the whole unit for 170 points. It's great. Don't forget, we can plus one save. Uh, we could also give them a five up ward save, so that makes them pretty tanky. First thing to say is that they can attach themselves to a single marshal, right? Uh, and when they do attach themselves, well, so to, specifically to a free guild marshal and relic envoy, when they do so, that unit, uh, the free guild general, then gets a four up ward save while it's in three inches of this unit which is nuts so then that unit's got a four up ward save these guys can get a four up war a five up ward save from the pope so then they're just doing really well Sawbones makes this unit even better uh, you can use this ability while this unit has a war surgeon so that's what the war surgeon does at the end of your hero phase you can pick up to three friendly 60 sigma human units while they're within 12 inches of this unit for each unit picked you can either heal d3 wounds or were return d3 wounds worth of slain models this is also really really good uh to this uh really really good and um you could also pick yourself i'm pretty certain uh like you can pick up to three friendly sigma units so you could even return a model into this unit as well but doing nine uh wounds worth of heals into your army every turn feels really good from the sore bones then you've got the Dispatch Spies, which is amazing, which you can only use this ability with this unit with the Whisper Blade. Once per turn, when an enemy unit issues a command, you can say the Whisper Blade will attempt to disrupt it. If you do so, roll a dice on a 4+, plus. that command is not received, the command ability still counts, it's having been used, and the command point that was spent to issue the command is lost. Each time a command is issued, no more than one attempt to disrupt it can be made. Incredible stuff. So, like each hero phase, you're going to you're going to disrupt a command ability. That's huge, especially when they want a pivotal uh, run. One of the ones that I see most is when someone uses a command ability to run a unit to grab an objective. They're like, "Oh, I can't guarantee that." You steal that. It's super good. Like that's amazing. Uh, sound the advance. You can use this ability while this unit is has a great herald. Add one to the run rolls and charge rolls for six to sigma human units while they're holding within twelve inches of this unit. Uh, in addition, when a friendly six a sigma human unit holding within 12 inches of this um, retreats, you can add D3 inches to this, which is again crazy because that means you can move those shooting units out of combat. Um, you could be places you weren't really expecting. That's really good. Finally, the tune of Corpus Somni. You can use this ability while the unit has a soul shepherd. In the battleshock phase, each time a model would flee from a friendly six a sigma unit while it's holding within 12 inches of this, on a four plus, that model does not flee. This unit cannot be affected by this ability more than once in the same phase. Now, what we already talked about earlier, that the artifact that this comes from is really, really good. Um, and it's probably the one that you would take in the City of Sigma army. So now it comes included in this unit, which is healing models and disrupting the enemy. Really great. I think for 170 points, this is excellent. And you absolutely should throw this in there into your armies. Just really good. Now we're going to look at the new minis, the new battle line for Cities of Sigmar. The Free Guild Steel Helms and their little pudding faces. which is absolutely fantastic. So these guys are battle line. For each one of these that you take as battle line, you open up a unit of Fusiliers to also be battle line as well which is cool. In addition, you can also have uh, the cavalry unit, the cavaliers be battle line if you have a free guild general, uh, free guild marshal, sorry, be your general. Uh, but we'll talk about more about that in a minute. So this is probably one of your core battle line choices, at least if you're playing humans. They got one wound each and a four up armor save. And they move five inches, so they're not super fast, but we already know you've got the order to make them move faster if you really want to. You could take sub-factions and other stuff. And they're Bravery 5. And Bravery 5 is a legit issue, especially on, uh, like, if you were to take a unit of 30 of these, as an example. I'm not sure why you would, but they are, that is a legit problem. However, we already know that if you take uh, the corpse that we just talked about, um, you potentially have it so that they're not all running away. Inspiring Presence will always come into effect as well. And these guys are 100 points. And that's brilliant because they're cheap enough that they're going to be really affected by economies of scale. Earlier on when we talked about getting plus one save, that's going to be really effective. And the Pope Mobile nearby means they're going to have a five up ward. So a unit of 10 of these um, is going to have a three up armor save and a five up ward. And they're going to cost 100 points, which is just crazy good. They have a champion, which adds plus one attack to their attack profile. Their attack profile is pretty minimal. They come on 25 mil bases. Two attacks each, fours, fours, no rend damage one. But we do know that there's a way to add plus one attack onto these guys as well from one of our orders. And we also know there's a spell for every six to hit. 
it's going to do a mortal wound. So even a unit of 10 of these could have 30 attacks, which could do five mortal wounds. So you could make them pretty fighty. They have this special ability called Consecrate Land. At the end of the movement phase, if this battle line includes a battle priest, sorry, not if this unit, sorry, includes a battle priest and is contesting an objective and it's not contested by enemy models, you can Consecrate it on a 3 plus. If you do so, friendly cities of Sigma human units have a ward of 6 plus while they're contesting the Consecrated objective. But if your opponent contests it, uh, then you it's no longer Consecrated and uh, they this no longer get the ward save. Now, this is fine if you weren't going to get the five up ward save, but you're going to get that, so it's a little bit redundant, but not bad, not bad at all. Um, and then finally, you've got hold the line. Each time this unit receives an all out attack or all out defense command, you can pick one other friendly unit within this ability that's wholly within 12 inches of this unit, sorry, that has not received this ability. Um, sorry, I'm gonna say this again, I apologize. Each time this unit receives the all-out attack or all-out defense command, you can pick one other friendly unit with this ability, so another Steel Helms ability, uh, of this unit, and has not received any commands this phase, that unit receives this command, the same command as this unit when the sequence ends. So, earlier on we found out that the Marshal, if he wanted to, could give someone like all-out defense for free anyway, and now you can pass that along to another unit, so they're also getting it for free, which is crazy. Uh, like really crazy. So the bravery being low, the standard bearer increases their bravery by one. That's a little bit difficult. Uh, their battle line though, and they open up other battle op line options. They open up the fusiliers, and they also open up the hunters. These are brilliant because they're cheap. They do what they need to do. They hold objectives. They can count for two on an objective thanks to the free guild marshal's heroic action. So you could have a unit of twenty of these counting as forty on an objective with a three up armor save, five up ward save, doing mortal wounds or sixes to hit like the buffs on these guys are crazy it's brilliant and they're great models coming in at the incredible 130 points is the free guild cavalier marshal uh so this is our mounted kind of like free guild marshal which is quite cool and if you think of his battle line don't forget that means that our cavaliers are also going to be battle line and he obviously synergizes really well with them He's okay in a fight, not great in a fight. He's got like four attacks, threes and threes, one damage, two. He's got some pistols, uh, but he's not that fighty, to be honest. Uh, but he's a great support piece. So he's 120 points. 120 points for this model, which is crazy. Not 130 points. Um, he's a great support piece. He's got for Sigma charge as an ability. When, when their finest hour heroic action is carried out with this unit, in addition to the normal effect, until the end of the turn, you add three to the charge rolls for this unit and friendly free guild cavaliers while they're wholly within 12 inches of this unit. He moves 10 inches. If you give him an order, he's going to move further. If you take him into a sub-faction that can move in the hero phase, these guys are going to move legitimately fast. 2d6 plus an order. They're going to be all the way over the other side of the board. And then with plus three to charge, they're going to be doing some crazy stuff. He's now also got the ability to run down the foe. The strike first effect applies for this unit if he made a charge in that turn and another free guild cavaliers unit wholly within 12 inches of him can also uh, fight simultaneously with this unit or fights immediately after. So he's got the strike first effect and then this unit fights straight after. So fight and fight, which is amazing. Uh, and as we talked about kind of earlier, if you take 15 cavalry, uh, fitting them inside wholly within 12 inches might be a bit of a problem, but they've got their ability to do a ton of mortal wound damage as well, which is really good. Um, just absolutely, we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute, but fighting first and then making those guys fight at the same time is brilliant. And he's so cheap at 120 points. Absolutely brilliant. So if you do have a marshal as a general, you can open the free guild cavaliers as your battle line option. And these guys are great, in my personal opinion. They move 10 inches, they've got two wounds each, they come as a unit of five. They've got a three up armor save, which is really good, especially as we know we can have plus one save and a five up ward very easily. The champion has got a special weapon called the Arc Knight's Blade uh, and has got an additional attack. And then the standard bearer in this unit adds plus one to the bravery, taking them up to bravery eight. They've also got the ability called Devastating Charge, which uh, on the turn in which they charge, you add one plus to, uh, plus one to the damage characteristic and improve the Ren characteristic. This means that the weapon, pro the profile from five knights charging is 15 attacks, well, 16, obviously, with the Arch Knight's Blade. Uh, hit on threes, wind on threes, Ren two, 
damage too, which is just a great profile. And as we know, we've got two different sub-factions that work really well with this. We have the sub-faction where they're going to do mortal wounds after they've initiated the combat, which is really, really good. And we've also got Mist Harven, where these guys can make a 2d6 move in the hero phase, meaning that they're definitely going to guarantee the charge. And with plus three to charge from the marshal on horse, these guys are going to be really good, in my personal opinion. Um, so, very cool. Very cool, very output -y, like lots of damage, can be very fast. Not as survivable as Chaos Knights, but Chaos Knights are used to pin units in. These are going to be used to murder units, uh, and I think that they're really cool. So uh, these, are, these are absolutely excellent. Also worth mentioning that this unit is 180 points, which is actually really fair. Really, really fair. On to the free guild Fusiliers. Probably up there, or the main unit in the book. Uh, they are phenomenal. 150 points for a unit of 10. They've got one wound each and a four up armor save and they move five inches. So they're a shooting unit. Mainly they're your main damage dealer in, well, they're the main damage dealer in this army. They have um, a champion who gets to add two shots to his uh, fusil cannon and a standard bearer who adds plus one to the bravery, taking them up to bravery six. And the bravery is low and is going to be a potential problem, especially if people make it so that you can't use inspiring presence with something like a horror gas or something. They've got the fusil's fire ability, which each time this model shoots with the fusil cannon. If this unit is in a fortified position, use the fortified position weapon characteristic. Otherwise, you've got to make the mobile one. We'll talk about that in a minute. And the fortified position uh, is if you move then you start in a fortified position, but if you move, you lose it, and you have to use the other weapon profile. But if you are in a fortified position, then you ignore negative modifiers against shooting attacks or missile attacks that target you. And you start with a four-up save, but you only ignore negative modifiers. However, um, you can add positive modifiers. So immediately, if you wanted to, using the Metal Wizard, these can have a three-up um, armor save, uh, against missile weapons, that's unrendable, and a 5-up ward save. But why do I think that they're the main damage dealer? Okay, oh, so, but you're like, oh, you're not going to be able to use the fortified position. We already know that from the orders earlier, you're going to be able to do a move with these guys and still count as having got the fortified position. So that's great. They've already gone past it. So you're going to use orders to do that all the time, which is really, really powerful. Uh, and you get an additional move, which means the 24-inch range of their fortified position is never going to be an issue because you're going to be adding 5 inches of movement plus an additional 2 inches, so they're going to be doing like 32 inches, 31 inches of potential threat range. They've got 2 shots each, so that's 20 across a unit of 10, with an additional 2 from the champion. Uh, and then they hit on 4s, wound on 4s, rend 1, damage 2. So when you do make these guys battle line, that means you're going to have 62 shots... If you do use the uh, the command trait we talked about earlier, you're going to be hitting on threes, wounded on threes, rend one, damage one, which is just an amazing amount of shots. And then in addition, if you cast a spell on them from the Metal Wizard, then these guys will be doing mortal wounds on sixes to hit, which means they're going to do about 10 mortal wounds from this unit. If you shoot at them, then I don't know why you would, because they're going to be ignoring any rend, and they're going to be shooting you back using the order, if you shoot units near them, they may also shoot you as well. If you charge them, then they are going to stand and shoot, uh, which is going to be really good as well. If you take two units to 30, you're going to be doing a 120 shots at about 31 inches, and they're crazy. But to finish this all off, they've got a little squire, uh, and he will do a resupply run. Once per battle, at the start of your shooting phase, in the third or subsequent battle rounds, you can say this unit will be resupplied by its Black Powder Squire. If you do so, you can reroll hit rolls for attacks made by missile weapons by this unit until the end of that phase. Where this gets even crazier uh, is this unit now is going to be rerolling hits from turn three. And because you just get to choose to reroll hits, so it's not just reroll misses, it's reroll hits. If you do do the mortal wound ability on them or the mortal wound spell, then you can fish for more sixes, taking your average of uh, 10 mortal wounds from a unit of 30 up to something like 15 to 18 mortal wounds, which is brilliant. These guys are just sentinels in another form. Uh, and in addition, which is quite exciting, uh, if you, they were to get in combat and if you were to take uh, the lady from Ashqui, uh, our general, she's going to be able to rally these on a 4+, plus while they're in combat. Absolutely amazing stuff. For 150 points, you can get the Fusil Major on Ogre Warhulk, 
which is a stunning model, stunning miniature, but it's counter the ogre culture. Ogres are heavy, this guy is thin, and ogres ride things, and this guy is ridden. He's a, a counter ogre. It's important to point out, not that important. Anyway, the Fusil Major is a hero, so he would get an order token to run around with. He's got a shooting attack called the Long Fusil, which is 24 inch range. Three attacks, threes and threes, rend one, damage D3. So it's not that impressive, uh, to be honest, uh, especially for his 150 points. He does have a couple of different things. He's got the Fortify position, so he can ignore uh, negative modifiers if he hasn't moved. Obviously, you've got the order to make him move and still keep the Fortify position, so that's not really that effective. Uh, he's got Range Finder, which is super important because he can be a support buff piece, which he picks a friendly Castellite unit, so that would be himself or obviously a unit of Fusiliers, which is more likely. You roll a dice and you add whatever the result of that dice is to the range of their missile weapons until the next, uh, it, during that phase, basically. Um, you cannot be affected by that ability more than once. So that does mean that you could add an additional six inches onto the range of those Fusiliers straight away, which is a crazy amount. He does have his own unique little ability, though, called the Crack Shot, which is big sense because he's got an amazing mustache. And that's how you know someone's good at shooting. If the unmodified hit roll for an attack made with this unit's long fusil is a 6, you can say that this unit has attempted a crack shot. If you do so, the attack sequence ends. After all this unit's attacks have been resolved, you can roll a dice for each crack shot attempted. For each roll that is at least double the target's wounds characteristic, pick one model from that unit to be slain. So you're only going to be able to slay a unit with 3 wounds or uh, less. But it's still really fun as a rule, being able to snipe some stuff. Would have been fun if it had been just roll a dice and kill that unit. So he was like killing heroes and stuff at range, which would be really cool. However, um, he's fine. He's 150 points, but for 150 points, you probably just want more Fusiliers, to be honest. Uh, so yeah, he's fine. He's pretty good. He's got a great model. Probably one of the coolest sculpts we've seen in a long time. The Iron Weld Great Cannon is really fantastic it's got eight wounds and a four up armor save moves three inches it's got the fortified position which we talked about already you know where you're going to ignore um you're going to ignore modifiers negative modifiers to shooting attacks which is pretty good you've got the order to skip that and then they've got it's just a cannon it's just a shooting piece it's got the shot and shell ability which is each time a model shoots with a great cannon choose either the cannonball armor piercing shell or grape shot shot or you do the scatter shot basically um okay so this is really rough because it's 150 points. Really rough. It's got 24 inch range on the cannonball, 24 inch range on the armor piercing shell, and the grape shot's 12 inches. We know we can do the order to move, but the the just it's just the profile's disappointing. Two attacks on the cannonball, hitting on four, wounding on a two, rend two, damage three plus two, d three plus two makes this quite consistent. Uh, because you're going to do like somewhere between three to five damage. The other version is two shots, hitting on fours, wound on two, rend four d6 damage, which is honestly really, really good. Um, like the rend four d6 damage, but the hitting on the four is rough, and d6, that inconsistency means you're going to roll a one. So I know I just said it was good. I didn't mean to say that. It was just automatic. It's actually bad. Like it just isn't good. It's 150 points. It's just always more economical to take 10 more Fusiliers. It doesn't like, it doesn't like, sh it doesn't like shut you down. It doesn't like stop you from moving. It doesn't like reduce your armor save. It doesn't do anything like. It just doesn't do as much as you would want it. There's a fun little combo I think, where you maybe could take four of these and you could take a Lord Ordinator from the Stormcast Eternals. He has an ability, and you can use it as an ally. He has an ability where every Order War Machine, which this counts as around it gets plus one to hit that would make the profiles pretty nice two attacks threes and twos ren two d3 plus two damage feels pretty good actually especially when you're taking that up to eight shots but you are going to spend more than 550 points to do that which is quite fun uh so i'm not sure if this is going to see as much play um but you could overload on it and have a great time uh, so we'll see we'll see. i'm interested to know what you think on this one i'm not convinced by this one the next unit we're going to look at is the steam tank commander and steam tank if you do take the steam can the steam tank commander as a general he will make the steam tanks battle line meaning you can have loads and i mean absolutely loads of steam tanks which is kind of fun an armored division a fully fortified fortress of dudes which is pretty cool so what does the steam tank commander and steam tank do so the steam tank commander is 270 points and the steam tanks themselves are 230 and they have 
12 wounds with a 2-up armor save. Now, don't forget, you have protection of fire in this army, so you could make it so they have a 2-up unrendable save, which is pretty nice. And if you had the Potemobile nearby, then they would have a 5-up ward save. So they can be very, very survivable, uh, which is pretty good. The output, though, is a bit risky. They've only got one shot with their steam cannon, but there is a way to improve that. Hits on a 4, wounds on a 2, rend 2, d3 plus 2 damage. There's also a profile for doing 2d6 shots. Uh, and uh, in combat, they have got 6 attacks, uh, which are damage 2, which is kind of okay. Uh, but it's not really worth it for the 270 points. But there might be a fun combo we can talk about in a minute. It's mounted, obviously. It's a hero, so he'll have an order. And if he wants to do any commands, because he's got the division commander ability... If he would like to issue a command, he can issue in the same command up to two times in the same phase. And if he does so, each command must be received by a friendly steam tank. No command point is spent the second time this unit issues that command in that phase. So he could issue all out attack twice, which is pretty cool. Um, now he's got the ability, or both all steam tanks have got the ability, more pressure. In your hero phase, you can say that this unit will overpressure its boiler. And if you do so, roll 2d6. If the roll is less than the number of wounds currently allocated to this unit, the unit suffers d3 mortal wounds. If the roll is equal to or greater than the number of wounds allocated to this unit, pick one of the following effects to apply, which is super cool. Number one, power the wheels. This unit can run and shoot or charge in the same turn, and it's got an 8-inch movement. So you might want to do that first turn. You might want to be like, cool, I'm going to add a 6, go 14 inches and charge. Then you've got power of the guns. Add one to the attack characteristic of this unit's steam cannon, and add D6 to the attack characteristic of this unit's steam gun. Uh, which is probably the one you're going to do. So you get extra attacks, which is good. And then you've got uh, Steel Behemoth, which is after this unit is charged, then uh, and, and pick one enemy unit within t one inch of this unit and roll a 2+, plus, a roll a dice on 2+, plus D3 mortal wounds. So that's quite a nice little selection of stuff. It definitely isn't this overpowering, overbearing unit, uh, but it will do some damage and it'll be fairly survivable. Uh, that's pretty much true of the steam tank itself. One shot, but you can obviously overpower it to have an additional shot. So you've got two shots hitting on fours. Um, it might be sensible to take a, if you're going to take loads of steam tanks, to throw a Luminarch, uh, not a Luminarch, sorry, a Hurricaneum in there. So everyone gets plus one to hit which would make all of their shots be a little bit better because then it'd be threes and twos ren two and you might have a pretty good shooting gun line that's very tough to deal with however they're not great for holding objectives each one of them is only going to count as two for holding objectives however i do think i have a fun little idea now if you were to take a steam tank commander in lethis this guy would be a hero and he would become a priest now, the priest spell in Lethis means you you ignore ward saves, or you can make an enemy unit uh, not basically have ward saves. But getting it there, because it's only 12 inches, is quite hard. So this is my plan. Take a steam count commander in Lethis, and then just yeet him up the board. Put protection of fire on him, so he has a two-up unrendable save. And then he'll get in a fight, loads of people try and kill him. And then he just pops his head out the hatch, pow, pow, says... Here is here's more murder. The spell's called murder, or it's a prayer. Sorry, the prayer's called murder. Rolls a four up. That unit ignores ward saves. Uh, sorry, that unit uh, doesn't have ward saves now. And then behind you is just a million fusiliers, and they just unload on that unit, and that unit dies. And then all that's left is a steam tank commander in the middle, twirling his mustache and saying priestly things. And I'm in. That's brilliant. Other than that probably never take steam tank commanders or steam tanks themselves but have a hilarious time if you do the wild corpse hunters are our skirmishing unit in the army uh, they have got some doggos and they can be battle line if you have a unit of steel helms uh, be battle line so one unit of steel helms one unit of wild, wild corpse hunters can then be battle line there's 11 models in this unit four of them are trail hounds and seven of them uh, are other units uh, other models sorry or humans uh, there's a Wild Corpse Warden in there, and one of the models has an Arbalaster. Uh, so, let's talk about this. Let's talk about their abilities first. They've got Expert Trackers. After deployment, before the first battle round begins, this unit can make a normal move of 5 inches. Now, this unit has got 11 models, but unfortunately, uh, they uh, have Bravery 5, so it's quite low. And they've only got a 5-up armor save, so they are not very tanky at all. Although... If they're near the Potemobile, they will have a 4-up armor save from the Metal Priest and a 5-up ward save. So that's pretty, that's pretty survivable too. 
But that pre-game move is going to be really important, especially if you're trying to build yourself a gun line, uh, or if you want to stop some alpha striking, or even do deep striking away from your lines. Uh, that's pretty good. Now, normally, units like that get removed by, you know, incidental shooting things, by Bliss Barb Archers kind of just get rid of those sorts of stuff. However, they have the ability Hidden and Dangerous. This unit is not visible to enemy units while it's in cover, or while it's more than 12 inches away from... Uh, 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 away from them in addition improve the rank characteristic of this unit's missile weapons by one while it's in cover so this is really really good so it means for a uh, units from outside of 12 inches aren't going to be able to shoot it and they're going to have to get closer and when you get closer you're going to get close to all of those guns or the counter charging which your army has so this is another way to make your opponent come towards you also means that you can pre-game move on to objectives which is also really really nice uh, because in the right battle plans that means you're going to do the pre-game move and the way it was faq'd is if you've pre-game moved onto an objective then you control that objective so now your opponent has to run across the board to try to get you off the objective which is super good are they perfect like no they've got a very weak armor save they're 140 points which is pretty expensive and they're bravery five so they're just going to run away but i think that they fulfill a role in the army which is really great and probably worth paying the points for Haxel Hexbane and Hexbane's Hunters are a Underworld's Warband, and they're 180 points. There's five models in Hexbane's Hunters, and obviously Haskell himself is a model. So there's six models in this uh, in this unit, um, and they've all got a five-up ward save. Uh, there's 10 wounds on Hexbane's Hunters and five from Haskell for 15 wounds with five-up armor saves, but a five-up ward save, which is pretty good. Um, Haskell himself has got a pretty interesting ability called Hunt with Conviction. After deployment before the start of the first battle round, pick one enemy hero or monster on the battlefield to be the target of the witch hunt. If there are uh, if there are any enemy wizard heroes on the battlefield, one of those must be picked instead. Add one to the damage inflicted by attacks made by this unit that target that unit. At the end of the combat phase, you can pick one enemy unit within one inch of this unit and roll a dice. Add one to the roll if that unit is a death demon or wizard keyword. On a 3+, plus, they suffer a more, uh, D3 mortal wounds. That's from the Flamewood Stakes ability. So, uh, plus one damage is pretty nice. Uh, his melee weapon, the True Fire Brand, would go up to damage 3 on Haskell himself. And the Black Powder Pistols um, uh, would end up being damage 2 because they haven't, uh, decided, they haven't put just melee attacks. And instead, uh, they've just put by attack so all of the attacks from hexbane's hunters will get plus one damage crossbow launcher would be d6 plus one the great axe would be d3 plus one that's got three attacks which is pretty decent um so uh, a, pr a pretty interesting unit uh, for 180 points you probably won't see it but the sculpts are phenomenal and if you were going to be a narrative sweet chestnutter and wanted to just have a good time i think they're cheap enough that you can include this unit and like just give yourself your own little personal mission where you're going to go and murder wizards with haskell's hexbane and and his hunters i think it's a it's a fun little thing to do in the game um and other than that you probably won't see much you won't see them see much play our last humans unfortunately for the human fans out there and then we move on to the dwarfs is Galen Van Denst and his daughter, Doralia Van Denst, who come as a set for 160 points. They both have a five-up ward save, and they have got five wounds each for 10 wounds. So it's pretty good. Uh, now, the thing about these two is they hate spells, they hate wizards, and they hate demons. So um, Galen himself has got a pistol, which is only nine-inch range, uh, with three attacks, and then uh, his runic broadsword in combat has got four attacks that's damaged too. However... Uh, he's got the weapon of banishment. You double the damage characteristic of an attack made by this model's weapons if the target is a wizard or a demon. In addition, when this unit model fights or shoots, you can choose an ender spell to be the target of any of its attacks. And if you do so, roll a dice to see if you hit. And if you do, you roll 2d6 and then you banish the spell against its casting value like you normally would, which is really awesome. Just, have you ever been such a badass that you shot a spell out of existence, out of the air? Amazing. But the damage, the double damage ability is pretty interesting. His runic broadsword has got four attacks at damage two. So he would have four attacks at damage four, which is pretty cheap. There are threes to hit, threes to wound, rend one. So the rend is probably the issue there. Duralia, on the other side, has got exactly that same ability, but she would have a damage four crossbow with two shots, threes and threes, rend two, damage four, which is amazing. So between them, between them, uh, there's the potential of doing uh, 16, 24 damage uh, to a wizard 
or a demon, which I think is crazy good. Uh, now, I don't necessarily think you should see them in competitive play, but like you can tell some great stories with both Hexbanes and Duralia, um, or oh, sorry, the, the Van Dents, because you could just do some really fun stuff, go wizard hunting, have a great time, amazing miniatures, and just cool. Now we're on to the dwarfs. <laughs> I don't know why dwarfs are always Scottish, but they are. Anyway, we're on to the dwarfs now. Humans are over, we're on to the dwarfs. And we just remind ourselves, they've got a pretty disappointing set of kind of allegiance abilities. Uh, but there is some stuff that could really benefit this particular army. There's some really fun combos, or this portion of the army. Uh, all the human stuff isn't going to be interacted. So we're into dwarfs, and they have got a bunch of stuff that's going to help them. So the first unit we're going to look at is the Warden King, who's 110 points. He's got six wounds, threw up armor save. It's quite defensive, but he doesn't have a ward save. Five attacks on his melee profile, threes and threes, rend two, d3 damage, which is not bad, you know, like, but he's only going to do about 10 damage, so he's not really like a frontline fighty character, even with his three up save, so he's not what we would call a duelist. He does have this ability, though, that makes him a support piece, which is the Ancestral Grudge Bearer. If this unit is picked to be your general at the start of the first battle round, you can choose an enemy unit and bear a grudge against it. If you do so, until the end of the battle, if the unmodified hit roll for an attack made with a melee weapon by a friendly Cities of Sigmar Dwarden unit uh, is a 6, you automatically wound the unit, uh, which is pretty cool. Uh, so automatic wounds against one unit in the enemy army. Don't forget, if we take the command trait we talked about earlier, where we bear a grudge, we can get plus one to hit against a, a unit as well. So I think that's kind of cool. That'll that'll help with that job. This is kind of like what you get with Bellacore, where you shut down an enemy unit. And in this case, you, you're definitely going to like focus fire on a single unit but none of this affects ranged attacks and it's just going to be a melee then you've got fearless leader in the combat phase after this unit has fought for the first time in the phase you can pick one friendly cities of sigmar dwarden unit that has not yet fought in that phase is within three inches of enemy units um and wholly within 12 inches of this unit so basically you get the warden king and another unit are going to get to fight at the same time dwarfs have slow movement they only move four um, they are going to struggle to get further up the board, although they can use the order for that additional movement, which is quite nice. And there are some sub-factions where you're going to get an additional moves out of them as well. So they could go quite far up the board if you built into that, which I think is quite interesting, and I probably would be doing, because they're slow. They're dwarfs. For 100 points, you can get a Rune Lord, a kind of uh, anti-magic support piece. Five wounds of the four-up save, moves four, uh, obviously, are pretty slow, uh, and is not very good in combat. He has two special rules, runes, runes of spell breaking. This unit can attempt to unbind one spell in the enemy hero phase in the same manner as a wizard. This used to have pluses to cast, and I don't really talk about the past, but I really have no idea why you would take that off. Being anti-magic is kind of a thing that they do, and that's not on there, and that's say, that's really lame. So anyway, so he's just not very good at stopping uh, enemy spells. Uh, and then there's Forge Fire is a prayer that you can cast on a four and a range of 18 inches. You pick a Dwarden unit, a City of Sigmar Dwarden unit, and you can improve their rend by one. Now, that's a pretty good prayer. It used to work on missile uh, attacks as well, but unfortunately, it only works on melee weapons. But that is, there are some good... The hammerers in this army are quite good, so that's not bad. But it's so unreliable because it's on a four... Uh, but he's really cheap. He's going to bring a command with him. So you may be going to do some counter charges, which is really nice. Don't forget, there's also the ability to give a unit a five up ward save. So it's nice to have these cheap characters to bring orders along. So you're going to be able to give these ward saves out to your big dwarven infantry blocks. One of the two battle lines for dwarven armies are the Longbeards. Uh, they come as a unit of 10, obviously. Uh, and they start with a uh, four-up armor save, but you do have the opportunity to either give them the Ancestral Great Axe or Ancestral Weapons. If you give them Ancestral Weapons, they'll end up on a save characteristic of three plus instead of four, which is really nice because obviously with you know something like a Mystic Shield or all-out defense, it will go to a two-up save. They have a champion, standard bearer, and a musician. The champion has plus one attack on his weapon. The standard bearer adds plus one to the bravery, and they are bravery nine, which is really nice. And they've got a musician, which lets them add plus one to their run and charge rolls, which is really good as well. Now, they're bravery eight, so bravery nine is good, but they move four. And I feel like with the orders to get the additional movement, they're going to be fast enough. And if you put them in something like the Mist Harven sub faction, they're going to be very fast and get into the mid board, which is nice. 
Uh, they do have an ability called I Thought Dwarden Made of Sterner Stuff, which is each time a Dwarden unit wholly within 12 inches or a City of Sigmar Dwarden unit of any friendly units with this ability uh, flee from Battle Shock on a 4 plus, you could just ignore it, which is pretty good as well. So, uh, like, they're in a good spot for being a defensive front line at 130 points. Uh, they can shut down um, your battle shock tests and your units running away. And you do have the ability to issue the order so that at the start of the enemy's combat phase, they can have a five up ward save. So they're a very tanky front line. If you wanted to give them, make them a bit more fighty though, they can have two attacks, hitting on threes, wound on threes, rend two, damage one. And if you were to give them the rune lord's ability, that'd be rend three, which is a lot of attacks. Especially if you to bump them up to a unit of 20. They're on small enough bases that you can fight in two ranks. Uh, so then that's going to be really good. Because there's a lot of attacks at Ren 3. So I think ultimately that's quite nice. They're not perfect. They're not as good as some of the other units in this book, obviously. But I think they're pretty good. There's not much to say about Ironbreakers other than they're incredibly defensive and really good as an objective holding unit that's just going to be very tough to shift. They're a battle line unit and they're 130 points. You get a unit of 10. They have a three up save characteristic and they've only got one wound each. They move four inches, but we've already talked about how you can make all that additional move happen. And they're bravery seven. Their champion uh, gets a Drake Fire Pistols and a Cinder Blast Bomb. The standard bearer adds plus one to their bravery, taking them up to bravery eight. And the musician allows them to uh, add one to their run and charge rolls. The Cinder Blast Bomb is a once per battle use uh, item that you use in the shooting phase. And you pick an enemy within six inches on a two plus, they do D3 mortal wounds. Now, the real trick here is the Gromril Shield Wall. If this unit is picked to do the Form Shield Wall, which is the order specifically available to Dwarden units in this army, then they'll get a 4-up ward save instead of a 5-up ward save. Don't forget that happens only in the enemy combat phase, so they're still very susceptible to things like shooting. But having used all-out defense or even getting a wizard in there and doing some Mystic Shield, you'll have a battle line unit that could be on a 2-up armor save and a four up ward save that's going to be very very tough to shift the one thing about them though compared to their other battle line unit the long beards is that they just don't have as much output they only wound on a four with their two attacks each hitting on threes and they have no rend obviously you can have plus one to the rend um via like uh, forge fire but these guys are just going to stand on objective and just be really really strong at doing that Hopefully, there aren't other units that can outscore them. But, I mean, you could put a lot of these guys on the board. At 130 points in a battle line unit, you can have a unit of 30 for only 390 points. It's going to be very tough to shift, uh, which I think is I think it's really interesting as a choice, Iron Breakers. Um, yeah, really, really cool. So, the Hammerers. These are, like, one of the best damage-dealing units in the book. They're 150 points for a unit of 10, and you will suspiciously know that on their War Scroll, they are missing their command group. They actually have a banner bearer and a musician, as well as a champion in this army. He's normally called a Warden King. Uh, so he's not in there, which I think is a bit weird. So I think this is just a copy and paste error, and I'm hoping that they're going to FAQ in it. In which case, you'll get plus one attack for the champ, you'll get plus one bravery for the banner, and you get plus one to run and charge from the musician, which is what they normally do. However, the King's Guard, um, the King's Guard here is their special ability that they have. At the start of the first battle round, before determining who has the first turn, you pick one friendly Warden King on the battlefield for this unit to be assigned to the same Warden King, kind of have more than one unit assigned to it. That Warden King has a 4 plus ward save, which is super nice, while it's within 3 inches of this unit. So he just gets a 4 up ward save. So that makes that Warden King much more survivable, way more survivable than uh, it normally would be. This is kind of like a proto version of attaching units, uh, model, sorry, hero units to models like we've seen in 40k. Um, so that just makes him great. The, the unit itself, it just does loads of damage. It's got two attacks each, threes and threes, rend two, but it's damage two. Obviously, don't forget, you can add forge fire to this, so it could be up to uh, rend three, which is just going to smash through units, which is really good. Maybe take a unit of 20, and you're going to have 40 attacks, 41 with, obviously, the Warning King. Uh, hit on threes, root on threes, rend two, damage two. Just, that's what they do. Great opportunity for this unit to be your countercharging unit, using the orders to do a countercharge. I think that's really nice as well. They'll get always strikes first in that situation, which I think is good. Um, just awesome. 
Really, really cool. At 160 points, you can get yourself 10 Iron Drakes, so dwarfs with guns. They move four inches, they've got one wound, and they've got four apartment safe. Their champion can either choose to have a Grudge Hammer Torpedo or some Drake guns and a Cinder Blast Bomb. That Cinder Blast Bomb is a once per battle use uh, D3 Mortal Wound Bomb in six inches on a two plus. Standard Bearer adds plus one to their bravery, and the Musician allows them to add one to their run and charge rolls. They have a special ability called Blaze Away. Add one to the attacks characteristic of this unit's missile weapons. If there are no enemy units with three inches of this unit and this unit has not made a move or been set up in the same turn. Uh, now, <laughs> now, this is really sad. The Drake guns that they have are 15 inches. If you move them, they've got a 19 inch effective range. And they've got one shot each, threes and threes, only rend one and damage one. If you compare these to the Fusiliers, which are 10 points cheaper, they're just worse in every way. The Fusiliers get additional setups to move, uh, like they can move further, like using orders and stuff. Uh, I mean, the Iron Drakes can do those as well, but they always maintain their two shots each, which is great. So like, they just do more shots more of the time, and they cost less points. The Fusiliers also can ignore Ren from shooting. Fusiliers also have the ability to shoot you back from the human orders if you get shot. And also, they have the other order from the shooting, which lets them uh, make a unit strike last. They're just, these are just always worse. Like, there are also a bunch of human buffs, like the plus one to save and the five up ward aura, uh, five up ward save, um, which also works in shooting as well. So just, it's just sad. Like, ultimately, they're fine. They're not terrible. They're fine. Um, uh, but they're not what they once were. And if you do get them in a position on the first turn, if you can forgo that first turn of shooting, run into the mid board, and then just set yourself up to be kind of shooting away, uh, then you will be getting a lot of attacks. You know, a unit of 30 will get 60 shots, very much like the Fusiliers. But unlike the Fusiliers, they will not be ignoring Rend. Um, they won't be, like, rallying as much. All sorts of stuff, really. Uh, so it's just a bit sad, a bit of a, a shame uh, that Games Workshop, honestly, have just forcing you into the, the human part of the book, even though the human part of the book is great. Coming in at 90 points, coming in at 90 points is the Cogsmith. Five wounds, three up armor safe. So quite defensive, which is quite nice. He is neither a shooting unit nor a combat unit, which is uh, a lovely, dis like, lovely kind of energy to be neither or any. He does have this ability called free arm, where he gets to either add plus one to hit to his Grudge Raker if he wants, or plus one to hit to his Cog Axe, depending on whichever he's armed with both of which are terrible and then he has this ability called the direct gyro corpse <laughs> this unit can issue commands to friendly gyrocopters and gyro bomber units anywhere on the battlefield so this is command abilities not orders uh, so command abilities so let's take a look at the gyrocopters which come in units of three and the gyro bombers which also come in units of three uh, if you wanted to take any of these i would suggest taking single gyro bombers and maybe multiple units of gyrocopters. The gyrocopters are 80 points. They got four wounds each with a pretty healthy three up armor save. They move 12 inches, which is nice, and their brimstone gun shoots 15 inches for a 27 inch effective range. It's three shots, threes and threes, rend one, damage D3. You could even potentially use the gyrocopters to kind of, you know, pin your opponent back or screen units or just basically be in the way. At 80 points, it's quite cheap. They have this once per battle ability where if they move over an enemy unit in the movement phase, make a normal move, for uh, roll a dice for each model in this unit. On a 2+, plus, they suffer D3 mortal wounds. So you could do, like, a load, which is pretty good. Uh, that's quite interesting. Like, a lot of mortal wounds, but it's only once per battle. And then after that, they probably die. Uh, and then the gyro bomb is a little bit more interesting because that does the same thing where you move over a unit and on a 2+, plus, they take D3 mortal wounds, and they'll do that every time they make a normal move. And that's legitimately quite interesting. Their shooting attack is 18 inches with five shots, threes and threes, rend one, damage two. For 120 points, that's not bad. You took four of them, you're spending 500 points, you get 20 shots. It doesn't scale as well as everything that we've talked about with the human shooting. And when you are building a city, is a CMR list. You've got to ask yourself, are you building fighting or shooting? And there are better options than the gyro bomber and the gyrocopters. Uh, but they maybe could see some play. You can maybe just just have them all circling in, dropping bombs, doing all the damage. It'd be quite fun. Uh, maybe add that in addition to some uh, of the human uh, 
Celestial Hurricanums, who are doing more additional Mortal Wounds Outrage, and just keep adding all that Mortal Wound in, which would be really fun. Um, and obviously would look phenomenal on the tabletop. That brings us to the end of the Dwarfs, and they are, quite rightly, a little bit disappointing. If you are a Dispossessed fan, as I am and have been for many years, I think it's quite okay to feel a little bit upset about what they're like, but that doesn't mean you should be too disheartened if you get the chance. Try to write some lists and try to work some stuff on the tabletop. Obviously, reading through books sometimes just isn't as good as putting it all on the table, and I'd love to know what your thoughts are. So if you are using like the dispossessed and thinking about some lists stick the notes uh stick it with the comments on in the youtube comments below and let me know because i'm interested to hear what your experiences are however let's move on to the elves dark elves first hero monster is a sorceress on black dragon with 14 wounds five up armor save that moves 14 inches it's a one cast wizard that um uh, that flies and obviously is mounted it has the command underlings special ability this unit can issue the same command up to two times in the same phase and if it does so each command must be received by friendly darkling covens unit no command point is spent the second time this unit issues the command in that phase so uh, that's pretty good it's an economy scale that you can use to make two units have like all out defense or all out attack or something like that that's okay um it's 270 points for this character it is not survivable uh, a five up armor save and 14 wounds it does not do a lot of damage in close combat, looking at its melee weapons. And it has a Noxious Breath ability, which has got a 9-inch range, and it can get up to 10 attacks. But when it does so, it hits on a 2, wins on a 3, and is round 1 damage wall, which is, again, pretty underwhelming. Uh, and then, finally, uh, it has a spell all of its own, which is called Bladestorm. It's cast on 6, it's got a range of 18 inches, don't forget. Uh, you can take a command trait for plus 1 to cast, and also... Uh, an artifact to increase the spell range by 6 inches. So it could be 24 inches. Uh, pick one enemy within range of us with a caster and roll 9 dice. For each roll that is less than this unit's save characteristic, that unit suffers a mortal wound. So mortal wounds are normally really good for punching through armor saves. So this is almost counter to how you would want to use armor uh, mortal wounds, which kind of skip the armor save step. And instead, you would just be doing 9 mortal wounds to a unit with a low armor save, which normally units with low armor saves have loads and loads of um uh like lo have loads of models and wounds in their unit the only way that this might be really really good is if you double this up with the spell oh no that doesn't even work with the melee weapons that doesn't work either there's no way to make this better i tried i'm sorry this is a sorceress is 100 points and it's a one cast wizard with a five up save i uh, sorry six up save and only five wounds so it is as they say squishy a squishy mage Obviously, it's rubbish in a fight, uh, but has got two abilities. Well, one ability and one spell. Blood Sacrifice is at the start of your hero phase, you can pick one friendly Darkling Covers model within three inches of this unit to be slain. If you do so, you add two to the casting. And as we talked about earlier, you can already add plus one as well uh, to the casting via the command tray. And if you take the artifact, you can increase the range of spells by six inches, which is good because Word of Pain is pretty cool. Word of Pain is a spell uh, that has a casting value of seven and a range of 18 inches. An enemy unit suffers D3 mortal wounds, and in addition, you subtract one from hit rolls to attacks made by that unit till your next hero phase. And, as we already know, there's that absolutely wicked uh, command trait, if you wanted, called Unparalleled Duelist, which for each hit roll that you miss uh, with an enemy unit that attacks your general with the Unparalleled Duelist, they'll take a mortal wound. So the idea is, make them minus one to hit, send in your general with Unparalleled Duelist, and make them just blow themselves up, which is super fun. And I guess, very Dark Elfy in many ways. The two battle line options that you have for the Dark Elves before you make any other Dark Elf your general, which will then make these be battle line, are the Dread Spears and the Bleak Swords. The Dread Spears have got one wound each with a four up save and they move six inches. They've got two attacks each, force fours, no rend damage, one. They've got a champion who has plus one attack, a standard bearer who has plus one to his, uh, the bravery, and a musician who has one to plus one to run and charge rolls. The special rule for this unit is add one to hit rolls for attacks made by this unit, the target an enemy unit that made a charge move in the same turn so they might be quite a good uh, opportunity uh, to use these guys as a counter charging unit using one of the orders which i think is quite fun uh, but they don't actually have a lot of attacks but one of the things i'm going to say loads and absolutely loads during uh, reviewing kind of the dark elf stuff is don't forget we do have a spell 
that we can put onto one of our melee units, which means the opponent is going to have a save dash. So the Darkling Spear unit have got two attacks each. If we took a reinforced unit of up to 30, uh, because they're 90 points for 10, it's not going to cost us a lot of points, but we're going to get 60 attacks, fours and fours, that is going to go straight through their armor and do damage one that's pretty good that's effectively 15 wound dice which is nice but there are better options for what unit we're going to put that on and we'll talk about that as we go through so those are the dread spears the bleak swords on the other hand they have got literally the same profile four up save they've got one wound each they move six inches they've got two attacks that are fours and fours no rent damage one they're champions plus one attack the standard bearers plus one bravery and the musicians plus one to run and charge their ability is and these guys are 100 points for 10 if the unmodified hit roll for an attack made with a darkling sword is a six the attack scores two hits on the target instead of one make a wound roll and save roll for each hit so you will generate more attacks out of these guys however reinforcing them is a problem reinforcing them is a problem sorry because they only have one inch range so you might not be able to get all of the attacks from units the other way like from the like from foot like from models further in the unit so the front row will be able to attack but probably the third row won't be able to attack so that doesn't make it doesn't make much sense um to reinforce this unit but they would end up with more attacks if they could be reinforced like the spears so they're kind of the same basically they're there to be screens and not do anything else which is the worst <laughs> so <laughs> that's what they do the dreadlord on black dragon is 280 points and if you do make him your general then you can make order serpentis or most importantly drake spawn knights be battle line he's got 14 wounds with a four up save and you would think mainly he would be a combat piece but he really isn't his output is pretty weak maybe the best version of taking a dreadlord on black dragon is to have a lance of spite uh, which has got four attacks threes and threes rend one damage two but on a charge we'll go up to rend three uh, sorry rend two damage three he does move 14 inches so quite likely to be able to get that charge off but it's still a pretty underwhelming melee profile he can fly and he's got a tyrant shield which means that he'll always pass an armor save of a six regardless of how much rend that you can do and then he's got the noxious breath attack that the sorceress on black dragon does which has got up to 10 attacks which doesn't do much damage and his final ability is under the shadow of the black wing you can reroll charge rolls for this unit and friendly order serpentis units wholly within 12 inches of this unit so reroll charges is nice uh, economies of scale buff it affects everyone around him and makes him i guess a bit of a support piece but at the pi price of 280 points you really just don't get a lot from this guy which is a bit of a shame so ultimately probably never take this if you get the chance for 140 points you can get a unit of five drake spawn knights they've got two wounds each and a three up armor save so they are very defensive 10 wounds with a three up armor save and they move 10 inches but don't forget that these are existing in a book where there are units that can also get plus one to save and have a five up ward save which the drake spawn knights don't get access to they're not terrible actually on the charge uh for for the points cost that they're at 140 points they've got five models obviously so they get 10 attacks from their barb lances hitting on threes wounding on fours and that is the really sad part that they're wounding on fours rend one and damage one but on the charge that'd be rend two damage two they get three attacks from their cold ones that they're riding which are three attacks threes and still wound on a four rend one damage one which is quite nice because uh, it's a lot of attacks and then uh, they've got a champion who gets plus one attack a standard bearer who has plus one to their bravery and a musician who has plus one to their run and charge rolls so ultimately they're a good knight kind of model they're not cheap enough to be a screen but they definitely don't know enough output as the other options inside the book and lastly they're not as survivable as any of the other options in the book as well so they just aren't what you want to take when there are other options that are better available coming in at 80 points per one and you can have a unit of up to three so you can spend 240 points on a unit of three you have the drake spawn chariots and they are just a smash impact hit unit six wounds apiece four up save move 10 which is fine uh, and they are rubbish in combat and rubbish at shooting so there's no reason to take them other than their side the runner's ability after this unit makes a charge move you can pick an enemy unit and roll two dice for each model in this unit 
If you've only got one model, you roll two. If you have a max unit of three, then you can roll six dice. For each roll of a two or a four, the enemy unit suffers a mortal wound. However, for each roll of a five, they'll suffer three mortal wounds. If the enemy unit was picked is within three inches of a friendly Drake Spawn Knights unit, you can add two each to those rolls. So if you have two units of three Drake Spawn Knights, that's going to set you back uh, 740 points and several hundreds of pounds. However, you'll do 54 potential mortal wounds in the charge phase. 54! That's crazy! You'll need some Drake Spawn Knights to try and make that more reliable, charge those in as well, put them all in Misthaven, make them all double move or like hero phase move because they're all mounted so they're going to go 2d6 in that phase and then just charge in out of the ether and just do a ton of more wounds. That's not even the max. We're talking 740 points. What if you were to take six units of three? That's right, 108 mortal wounds in one charge phase some people said it could be done but the drake spawn knights could be the best army you've ever lost a game with coming in at 140 points and completely changing what miniatures you may see on the tabletop are the black guard now they can be battle line if your general in your Caesar Sigmar army is Darkling Coven. So if they're one of the Dark Elves, basically. They've got a six inch move. They've got one wound each and a four up armor save. Bravery seven, the standard bearer adds plus one bravery. Champion plus one attack. Musician plus one to run and charge. They've got two attacks each in combat. Threes and threes, rend one, damage one. So not tons of damage, but they do have two inch reach. So the fact that these guys can be battle line, you can take these guys up to a brick of 30, is actually pretty cool because they're going to be able to attack in at least two ranks because they've got a two inch reach so that's a lot of attack 60 attacks from a unit of 30 not forgetting of course that you can make it so units uh if you were to buff this unit they can make it so the enemy's armor save is dash but where they've got the most amazing ability they've got steel and sorcery this ability allows them to have a ward save of four plus while they're within three inches of any friendly sorceress units so this is a Black Guard unit that's going to have a 4-up armor save, a 4-up ward save, obviously all-out defense of Mystic Shield, and that Sorceress gets a 4-up ward save while they're within 3 inches of the Black Guard unit, which I think is really interesting as well. So then the Sorceress is more defensible, the Black Guard are more defensible, and I could legitimately see two units of these in the middle of the board, like just with their ward saves near their Sorceresses being really, really strong. And that's incredible. What? Just brilliant. Absolutely. Uh, this obviously does not include a sorceress on a black dragon. Of course not. Obviously, they don't want you to get one of those. Uh, but black guard are looking really good. Executioners are 170 points for 10. They've got one wound each, a four up armor save. They move six inches. And they have the standard kind of command loadout in the champion, the standard bearer, and the musician. They have a special ability, only one, Severing Strike. If the unmodified hit roll for an attack made with the Executioner's Drite, which is the weapon they're equipped with, is a six, the attack causes six, two mortal wounds to the target and the attack sequence ends, which is pretty good. They've got two attacks each. So a unit of 10 that costs 170 points can have 20 attacks and then any sixes are going to cause two mortal wounds. So you should generate six mortal wounds out of this unit. Other than that, they hit on three, wound on three, and they're rend one. And then they're damage two, which is also really excellent. Unfortunately, they only have one inch range on the weapons. So getting to fight in two ranks is quite, three ranks is difficult. Two ranks is easy because they're on a 25 mil base. So being able to take these into a unit of 20 would work, and 40 attacks on these would be amazing. These are actually, mathematically, thanks to my friend Barton, the best damage dealing unit in the book now obviously this is taking into account the fact that you're going to be able to make it so your opponent's armor save is dash but you can do some incredible damage with these guys and considering in this part part of the book or the elven part of the book you can also have some tanky units uh, with a four up ward save you can do a classic hammer and anvil especially with the counter charge orders that are available as well that's pretty fun. I like that idea. And it'll be really fun to see Blackguard and Executioners like mopping up the tables with people. They are expensive at 170 points, but they do the damage, which is the important part. So maybe get some Executioners. Dark Shards are 120 points for 10. 
They're a missile unit with one wound each and only a five up armor save. They move six inches and their shooting weapon is 16 inch range for 22 inches effectively. Four up save, uh, sorry, uh, hits on a four, wounds on a four, uh, and they have this standard kind of loadout of champion, standard bearer, and musician with everything the other units have. They have one ability called the Storm of Iron Tip Bolts. Add one to hit rolls for attacks made with this unit's repeated crossbows while it has 10 or more models. While these are 40 points cheaper than our Fusiliers from the human range, they just do not get any buffs like the Fusiliers do. They don't have orders that are strong, and these just aren't a good pick. However, they're very cheap. You could have literally tons of them, tons and tons and tons, loads and loads, and then just blot out the sun with arrows, which is a legit tactic, but I don't think it's going to be quite enough. They've got low enough bravery that that's going to be an issue, and their survivability is also an issue as well. So these aren't really for me. The first of our monsters from the Dark Elves is the War Hydra. It's got 12 wounds with a 4-up save, and it moves 8 inches. It has a shooting attack, which is very similar to the Black Dragon shooting attack, which is fine can have up to 10 attacks twos and threes rend one damage one which is quite nice and then it has two melee profiles six attacks at a damage three for a potential 18 damage uh, and then uh, two attacks with some goads and whips for damage one so it's not bad uh, output for 180 points it also has sever one head uh and, and another one takes its place and that's an ability it has and at the end of the combat phase you can heal up to five wounds allocated to this model which is fine it makes it a bit like a Vampire Lord and Zombie Dragon. And it's at the end of every combat phase. So you have to go in. You have to do all 12 damage. Otherwise, it's going to keep healing itself every combat phase. It doesn't even need to be in combat. So it might genuinely stick around and pin units in with its 4-up armor save, which is quite good. But it isn't going to pin people as much as Blackguard. And it's going to do, not going to do anywhere near as much damage as Executioners. So I don't really see why I would take it. The Charybdis is 160 points. It's 12 wounds with a 4-up save, and it's a monster, which means it can do stomp and all of those really positive things that monsters can do in an army. It's got a pretty good uh, combat profile, 5 attacks that do damage 3, which is okay. But importantly, it has an ability called Abyssal Howl. Enemy units cannot receive the Rally and Inspiring Presence commands while within 12 inches of this unit. Now, you would already pay 50 points for Horogast in an army, which does a similar thing, making you not be able to use Inspiring Presence, but it doesn't have the Rally effect. So you kind of get in the bonus of two different units, uh, sorry, two different abilities for the same, for like in one place, which is quite nice. It's within 12 inches, which is good. It's got an okay survivability, 12 wounds on a four up save, but for 160 points, this might be a legitimate pick to put into a Cities of Sigmar army, maybe even into the port human portion of a Cities of Sigmar army to add to all of that shooting and fighting and other stuff that you're going to do and make it so that they can't do Rally and they can't do uh, Inspiring Presence. Actually, pretty good. Like, I could see it being in there, honestly, which is awesome. The Squadron of Chariot is, or the Squadron of Chariots, sorry, is a unit that comes in as a single model or you can have it as a unit of three and they're 80 points and 240 points respectively. Six wounds per chariot with a five up armor save if they move 12 inches. They're kind of a gun platform. Uh, they have the Ravager Harpoon, which is two shots, threes and threes, Ren 2 damage D3, unless you're shooting at a monster, in which case they are flat damage three. So if you take a full unit of three of these, you can have six shots that are doing up to three damage each to a monster, which sounds pretty good. I just don't think it has quite the output that you need, especially compared to some of the other units. Maybe even the cannons are better than the chariots. Um, and then especially the other chariots that can charge in and do more wounds. So I don't think these are quite as good as the other chariots or as good as some of the other units in the book. The Black Ark Fleetmaster is 90 points. It's got five up save, uh, sorry, four up save and five wounds. It's got five attacks in melee, threes and threes, rend one damage two, which is actually quite fighty for such an incredibly cheap character. And then he has a couple of abilities. His first one is Murderous Swashbuckler, which is very fun. If the unmodified hit roll for an attack made with a melee weapon that targets this unit as a one, the attacking unit suffers two mortal wounds after all of its attacks have been resolved amazing stuff like again very much like we saw with the command trait if you throw this unit into combat then you can make it so that your opponent is just taking loads of mortal wounds for the pleasure of trying to kill you which is very funny especially if you were to take multiple of them of the obviously if you were shooting at them they would just die but lookout sir will help you in that regard it's actually quite a fun rule and then at the mucurs 
is an ability. When this unit issues the all-out attack command to a friendly pri Scourge Privateers unit, like the one we just talked about, our, um, our chariot with the crossbow on top, add one to the attack characteristic of that unit's weapons until the end of that phase, in addition to the normal effect of all-out attack. So plus one attack is pretty nice to some uh, Scourge Privateers. This will also affect... Um, this will also affect the next unit we're about to talk about, our Black Arc Corsairs themselves. Um, so, yeah, Scourge Privateers, plus one attack to their weapons. Quite good, especially when you're getting plus one to hit. Um, I don't think that makes the Chariots good enough, but it might just tip them over the edge. Having nine attacks from unit of three, pretty nice. Black Arc Corsairs are 90 points for a unit of 10. They have the standard kind of loadout of Champion, Standard Bearer, Musician for plus one to charge and plus one bravery and all that stuff that the other units have they've only got a five up armor save which is a bit of a shame but they do have some pretty cool stuff going on they can either have a repeater hambo and a vicious blade or they can have a pair of vicious blades the repeater hambo has got a nine inch range it's got two attacks fours and fours no rend and damage one uh, and then the vicious blade is just one attack so it's kind of like a pretty mid profile with a pair of vicious blades though it's one inch range but it's three attacks and as we know from the black arc fleet master we can add plus one attack to that profile taking them up to a total of four attacks fours and fours no rend damage one these guys can be battle line in a uh, city sigma army if the general is uh, basically a scorch privateer so the black arc fleet master so that means uh, that <laughs> you can have a unit of 30 of these with four attacks each which is pretty crazy that's going to give you uh, 120 attacks, which, if you were able to get them all in, they've only got one inch range, so it's probably not possible, and you were able to get the spell off so that you can ignore armor saves, then, uh, like, they can potentially be giving you 30 wound dice, which is crazy amounts of damage, uh, which is so, so good. If the uh, They've also got an ability called Skilled Swashbucklers, if the unmodified hit roll for an attack made with a melee weapon, the target's unit is a 1. The attacking unit suffers one mortal wound after all of its attacks have been resolved. So they also have the opportunity to take a load of damage and then receive uh, push mortal wounds back. And they're cheap. Super cheap. Super cheap to keep sending them out, making them die, and then send another wave out again with a spell off and just keep throwing them out at people. Especially crashing upon the enemy. Uh, when uh, you're tanking with your black guard, holding objectives with your uh, big ward save and big armor saves, which I think good as well. Um, so these are just, yeah, these are a hundred and... Uh, these, no, these are 90 points. 90 points for 10. So they're just absolutely brilliant, I think, actually. Like, really, really cool. Like, really good. There is There are some really good stuff in... The, the elf portion of the book, the black guard, the executioners, uh, the sorceress, the spell that they've got, uh, the command trait that they've got. Like, yeah, there's some legit stuff here. The assassin is 90 points. And the only thing this guy is going to murder is your feelings for taking him. He's got five wounds with a five up armor save. He's got a couple of abilities. He's got the death's head poison, which any sixes to hit with his weapon is going to cause D3 mortal wounds. And the attack sequence ends. He has the ability, ability Hidden Murderer. And while this unit is within three inches of a friendly Cities of Sigma Elf unit that has three or more models, this unit is not visible to any models that are more than 12 inches away from it. Which uh, is pretty pretty crazy because he's a hero anyway. Uh, so Lookout Sir already applies. But I guess he won't get shot with spells, which is interesting because Lookout Sir only applies to missile weapons. And finally, he's got In for the Kill. The Strike First effect applies this unit if it made a charge move in the same turn. However, the Assassin has got a pretty rubbish attack profile. Six attacks, threes and threes, rend one, damage one. And while he's 90 points, he's not very fun. And I'd be taking Derelia Van Dentst or something like that in an army to have a bit more adventure with. Our final unit in the Dark Elf roster is the unit of Dark Riders. They're a cavalry unit, and there's five models in this unit, and they come in at 150 points. They've got an armor save of 4+, plus and they've got two wounds each. So 10 wounds for 150 points is not too bad. They're very quick at 14 inches, and their bravery is higher because of the standard. The champion gets plus one attack, and they get plus one to run and charge, thanks to the musician. They've got a special ability called Shadow Raiders. This unit can retreat and still shoot and or charge later in the turn. In addition, add one to hit rolls for attacks made by this unit if it made a retreat move in the same turn. 
Now, this is pretty good because you want to make these units bop around, do grab objectives and be annoying, which I think is interesting. However, that ties in really nicely with what their next ability is. So terror and confusion. Roll a dice each time an enemy unit issues a command within 12 inches of any friendly units with this ability. On a 5+, plus, that command is not received, and the command point that was spent to issue that command is lost. Now, in a Cities of Sigmar army, this will work really nicely uh, with our command group we talked about earlier, where we also can shut down enemies' ability to issue commands. Geminids is only 50 points as an end of spell, and pretty much does the same job, but you have to get involved in spellcasting. Dark Riders are a lot more expensive, they're 150 points, but they can potentially shut down a load of command abilities as well. So you could potentially build a, especially if you added Geminids into this army as well, you could be trying to shut down as many command abilities from the enemy army as possible by comboing the Dark Riders with Geminids and also uh, the human part of the book, which I think is fun. Right, that's all of the War Scrolls. Let me know what your favorite ones are. And now let's go look at how you would win with this army. Specifically, let's look at the grand strategies and the battle tactics. Grand strategies for this army, they have four that you can choose from. You can only pick one, obviously, on your army list. The first one is the exemplar of the Academy Marshal. When the battle ends, you complete this grand strategy. If you complete at least four battle tactics for every battle tactic you completed, this battle was from the four honor and glory list below. So if you complete Cities of Sigma ones, I'm not 100% certain you're going to do that. So... This would be interesting, but depending on your army build, you might build into specifically doing those army tactics, and then this one would be much easier to go do. Reclaim for Sigmar. When the battle ends, you complete this grand strategy if there are at least one friendly cities of Sigmar unit wholly within each large core of the battlefield. That's going to be more difficult to achieve because you can't necessarily guarantee you're going to have all of those units. If you just come up against 60 zombies and they've just got a corner of the board, um, uh, it's probably unlikely you're going to take that. Uh, you got hold the high ground. When the battle ends, you complete this grand strategy if there are any friendly units within 12 inches of the center of the battlefield and no enemy units within 12. Again, that's very difficult to do, guaranteeing your opponent won't have a single model within 12 inches. So probably avoid that. And then banners held high. When the battle ends, you play a total. Uh, you play a total of the number of standard bearers in units with the totem keyword in their army that are on the battlefield. If your total is higher, then you complete this grand strategy. That one honestly feels like something a Cities of Sigmar army can do. If you're running all steam tanks, that's not going to be very good. But if you're running loads of the human units or loads of the elven or dwarf units, there's lots of banners. Each almost every unit has a banner, so that feels like the one that probably is the one you're going to go after if you're going to choose from this selection. Looking at the battle tactics, the first one is bring full arms to bear. Pick one enemy unit, you complete this battle tactic if the unit is destroyed this turn and the suppressed as a result of the suppressing fire order. Now, that's the one that we saw earlier, uh, which is the order that you're going to give to a human unit only. So that is a human battle tactic. Uh, and so one you're probably going to do a lot because you're probably going to do a lot because you're probably going to take lots of fusiliers. The next one is raise the banner. You pick one objective controlled by your opponent. You complete this battle tactic if you controlled uh, that objective at the end of this turn. And if a friendly free guild command corps includes a great herald contest it. So that's that group of models that we talked about earlier. And again, if you do take them in your army, you're running a human army. So this is a human one that's going to be uh, pretty easy to achieve because you're basically grabbing a tactic with that unit nearby. Uh, but if you don't include it in your list, you won't do it. Next one is Black Powder Bombardment. You complete this battle tactic if three or more enemy units were destroyed in your shooting phase this turn. This is another one where you get two points for running lots of shooting models in your army. And the humans do the best shooting. So it's pretty crazy that this entire portion of battle tactics is built specifically not only for the humans portion, but the human shooting portion of the book. Uh, mount the charge. Pick one objective you controlled by your opponent. You complete this tactic if you control that objective at the end of the turn. And every friendly unit that contests it has a mount and made a charge this turn. So if you are running loads of cavalry or even if you're running loads of chariots, that's one that's more likely for you to do. And is the first one that is non-human related pretty much. Strike without warning. You complete this battle tactic if three or more friendly cities of Sigmar elf units made a charge move this turn. Not forgetting that we're going to be able to give the order out to elves to make them have always strikes first. We could potentially get a lot of units in to do this, which is quite fun. So that's actually one that's achievable for the elves and the only one so far. And then Iron Might, you complete this battle tactic at the end of the turn. If three or more friendly cities of Sigmar Dwarden units fought this turn 
and no Dwardian units were destroyed this turn. And so that's the end of the review for the Cities of Sigmar book in 2023. This isn't going to be the only video I make on Cities of Sigmar. We're going to make some tier lists. I'd really like to look at the narrative and lore and talk about that as well. I'd also make to, like to make a bunch of army lists and kind of showcase off those as well. So expect more videos in the future. And if you do like what I've done, please like and subscribe and obviously join Patreon and all those other things. That'd be good. What are my final thoughts on the book? I mean, they just want you to buy the humans. I think that's a really fair point to make. And I really like the human miniatures. I said this several times during this show. I like them. I would like to buy them. I'd like to get them on the tabletop. I think they're great. But they just definitely want you to do it. The kind of nail in the coffin for what they specifically want you to do in this army is in the battle tactics where you know three of them felt like they were just geared directly towards the shooting units from the humans some of the units in that portion of the book also feel over or underpriced and overperforming for what they're doing they're doing a lot of stuff especially when you compare it to the other portions of the book i wish they would just come out and say we don't want to support the dispossessed or dark elves at this point i feel like that would make a lot more sense and i feel like the dark elves have got more play than the dispossessed but I don't think they're useless. I think you could definitely get play out of both of them, uh, which I think is which I think is okay. I think the human portion of it has got an incredible aesthetic, like just amazing. Uh, I think there being eleven cities gives them so much scope in the future for world building and and kind of expanding how the game looks and how the cities of Sigmar work as well. So I'm excited by that. Uh, I really am. I maybe would have liked to have seen like some other units for the human portion because obviously they're focusing on that, so I'll focus on it. I would have liked to have seen a heavy weapon option, like a great sword variant. Would have also been really fun to have seen um, maybe some sort of like sneak, like not an assassin unit as such, but you know some sort of deep striking unit would have been fun as well. But ultimately, you, I don't think you could be unhappy with how the book like looks if you're excited about the human portion. If you aren't excited about the human portion and the other bits. I like what you're most excited about. I think you've got every right to feel a little bit upset, but I think you could still probably play really well and have a great time. Hope you enjoyed the review. Thank you to the Twitch chat for hanging out with me all day, uh, which has been super fun. And if there's anything you would like me to see, make as content or anything you'd like to see as content, the best way for me to know that is for you to comment in the links below or in the wherever and then just let me know because that's how I know what you want me to make. So I hope you've enjoyed it. Thanks for tuning in. I'll see you soon.